Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, to begin with, I'm going to request Dr. Vandana Baranwal, our board of director, and Dr. Rajesh Kanwar, our uh, core volunteer at Council for Ayurveda Research, to start with the invocation. Thank you, Dr. Pratibha. I am honored to have this chance to invoke Lord Ganesha to bless this event. Ganesha is the supreme being who ensures success and removes obstacles from the path. Shuklambar dharam vishnum shashivarnam chaturbhujam prasannavadanam dhyayet sarva vighnopashante Om as we begin, I would like to announce housekeeping rules. For everyone, please keep your microphone on mute and video off when not speaking. Please post the questions and suggestions that you may have in the comments box. Please raise your hand if you would like to say something. Please switch off all gadgets and be mindful of all background noise. I thank everyone in advance for their cooperation. Moving forward with the event, I would like to invite Dr. Uh, Dr. Vandana, wait, uh, Dr. Uh, Rajesh will be. Oh, I'm sorry. No yes. problem. I invite Dr. Rajesh. Dr. Rajesh, please. Thank you, Vandanidhi. <clears throat> I am Bandhur Yam Chayeti Ganna Laghu Chetasam Udar Charitanam Tu Vasudhev Kutumbukam. This means the whole world is a single family. The concept of Vasudhev Kutumbakam is deeply imbibed in Indian philosophy, which inherently connected with Ayurveda. This statement is not just about peace and harmony, rather by contemplating this idea or by at least trying to live by it and practice it in our lives, we could make this world a better place. This GCCRA quarterly meeting organized by CAR is a pure and honest effort to this idea. Thank you so much, Dr. Mandanadi. Thank you, Dr. Rajesh. Moving forward with the event, I have this profound pleasure to invite Dr. Pratibha and introduce her. She is the founder and president of the Council for Ayurveda Research, an Ayurveda practitioner and educator of repute dynamic speaker, prolific writer. She is the force behind this event. Please welcome Dr. Pratibha Shah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vandana. Now, uh, let's get started with the program for today. <clears throat> Namaste to all dignitaries and subject matter experts from around the world. It is my privilege to extend a very warm welcome to all of you on behalf of Council for Ayurveda Research. Before we begin with the agenda for today's meeting, let me take just a few minutes of your time to introduce the organization and provide some context for today's gathering. First about the organization, I founded Council for Ayurveda Research in 2012 with the vision to promote and establish Ayurveda as an evidence-based health science globally. In 2017, we formally registered as a 501c3 nonprofit in USA. Today, I would like to acknowledge all the people who have joined on the way for some time or longer time and added body and roots to the vision of CAR. Today, we are a strong group of 40 plus professionals in various roles and capacities across USA, India, Singapore, Australia, and more. We registered our sister NGO in India in 2018 under the name of Ayurvidya Anusandhan Abhiyan Foundation, AAAF for short. For some of the glimpses of our work so far, please do check out our website. I'll request Dr. Rajesh to share the URL of our website in the chat. With today's meeting, Council for Ayurveda Research 
is formally kick-starting the Global Consortium for Collaborative Research in Ayurveda, or GCCRA for short. This is an outcome of the larger event that was held in September of last year. And many of you were present in that event. I'm grateful to all of you for having taken time off of your busy schedules to partake in this mammoth effort. Today's gathering has people from diverse backgrounds and specialization. But what ties us together is our common passion for Ayurveda. It is now time to consolidate and channelize that passion. Um, Dr. Uh, Mahadevan, if you can continue to admit people. Thank you. I'm admitting too. Um, sorry. It is now time to consolidate and channelize that passion with laser focus and clarity to shape a clear roadmap for Ayurveda Vision 2030. It is time to not just dwell in our past glory, but to actually make, make that glory worthy with our actions today. To sustain, to maintain, to inculcate that level of scientific and critical temperament that our aptas had. To also pass on that curiosity and inquisitivity to the next generation, to instigate the young minds to not accept anything without questioning, because that is how our aptas were. They entertained and even welcomed difference of opinion and with logical examination of all arguments would then select a consensus theory which would then lead to the formation of a principle. This is what we need urgently today to revive and re-inject in our student community, in our teachers, in our practitioners, that basic curiosity, that critical eye, in short, the scientific temperament. The idea for a global think tank that can pursue this vision with a continuum of connection and collaboration has been brewing for some time. So what you see today in this very first meeting of the global consortium did not happen overnight. It has taken a lot of rumination, effort and energy to envision and present what you're seeing today. I would like to thank the GCCRA core organizing committee, the board of directors, and all of the other volunteers for their time and support in helping in making today's event a reality. At this time, I'm going to request Dr. Rajesh to share the GCCRA charter that has evolved from the September event and will be a broad guideline or guiding document for the consortium. Dr. Rajesh, if you can share that in the chat box. I'm happy to announce that we already have a robust advisory board as well as a steering committee for the conclave, most of whom have confirmed their participation and position in the consortium. And I'll quickly read some of the names, proposed advisors, Dr. Ashok Vaidya, uh, Dr. Bhushan Patwardhanji, Dr. Geeta Krishna, Dr. Ram Manohar, Dr. Vijay Bhatkar, Dr. Jeffrey Y, Dr. Darshan Mehta, Dr. Balram Singh, Dr. Abhimanyu Kumar, and Dr. Tanuja Nesri. Some of you are already here. And in the steering committee, we have Dr. Akash Kimbavi, Dr. Asmita Wele, Dr. Kishore Patwardhan, Dr. Supriya Bale Rao, Dr. Ashwini Godbole, Dr. Ashwini Kumar Rao, Dr. Vandana Baranwal, Dr. Minakshi Gupta, Dr. Mahadevan Sitaraman, Dr. Anupama Kizikivitil, Dr. Ram Rao, Dr. Dinesh Gyavali, Dr. Bhavna Parashar, and uh, we could be adding more. And um, I would like to conclude by saying that this is just a beginning. This is just our first meeting. And hopefully we will, uh, through the quarterly meetings, we'll be able to maintain a continuity in our vision and all of the action items that we will be taking out of each meeting, we will be convening and checking in if we are we have we are doing good progress on them as we start to meet every quarter next proposed meeting you can take uh, a note of this date i will be announcing this again at, towards the end may 15th same time 
most likely it will be two hour long because uh, this is a kick start kick off meeting so it's a little longer but otherwise it's going to be most likely two hours long but may 15th is the date next meeting and with that i would like to invite dr uh, kishore to proceed with the next uh, agenda item here for today's meeting dr not dr kishore dr akash kimbabi sorry dr akash kimbabi is has an md in shalatantra from ipgtrna jamnagar he is presently working as principal of jain agm ayurvedic medical college and hospital in karnataka he was a visiting professor at two universities at london um he uh, so curriculum design teaching methodology innovation and research designs in ayurveda are his areas of interest dr akash over to you namaste uh, dr pativa ji uh, has dr bhushan patwardhan ji joined because i'm supposed to introduce him uh, we can him. take dr tanuja first so if you want dr uh, bhushan ji dr. have you uh see his name yet uh, okay so introduce i think dr kishore has to introduce dr tanuja ji okay dr kishore you can invite dr kishore to okay do that sure namaste everyone uh, it's an honor and a privilege uh, to be on this platform with all these tall words of ayurveda uh, uh, actually i was supposed to introduce uh, dr bhushan ji and uh, invite him for his talk but because he is not at joint i now request dr kishore to kindly proceed ahead and uh, introduce dr tanuja uh, madam and invite her to give her talk dr kishor thank you please. thank you dr akash uh, it is my uh, privilege to introduce professor tanuja nesari ma'am though she doesn't need any in introduction uh, she is presently the director at all india institute of ayurveda new delhi she completed her uh, md ay and phd in dravya guna vigyan from gujarat ayurveda university jamnagar uh, Professor Tanuja Madam is a chair for Health Sector Sub Skill Council for Ayush under Ministry of Ayush, Government of India. She has also worked as a Chief Executive Officer at National Medicinal Plant Board, Ministry of Ayush. She has worked as uh, an Additional Director, Academics and Medical Superintendent at uh, Chaudhary Brahm Prakash Ayurveda Charak Sansthan under Government of uh, NCT, New Delhi. she has also worked as principal and uh, medical superintendent at uh, tilak ayurved college pune she has worked as chairperson a uh, chairman of managing committee and governing council member and as member of research and recognition committee at pune university she is also a member of board of research at health university nashik she is a member of governing council of my own university institute of medical sciences banaras hindu university she is also a member on academic board of various universities like Uh, ITRA Jamnagar and different national academic and research bodies, and is involved in academic administration, curriculum, syllabi development, policy making, and so on for for effective education in Ayurveda. She is a recipient of Best Ayurveda Teacher Award of the year 2005. She has guided more than 30 postgraduate students, 20 PhD students, and three MPhil scholars in Dravya Guna and Rasa Shastra. Also, she has visited many countries. for conducting cme courses and other teaching assignments in ayurved uh, professor tanuja madam is uh, an acclaimed international speaker on ayurveda and has organized a series of national and international seminars workshops cme programs and, and on on medical plants and medicinal plants and exhibitions she has uh, successfully completed more than 20 clinical research projects as principal investigator she is a principal investigator on a joint collaborative project of All India Institute of Ayurveda with UK College of Medicine, UK Prince Charles Foundation on uh, assessment of holistic Ayurveda module, Ayur Yoga module in the patients suffering from fibromyalgia. Uh, her main area of interest is Ayurveda teaching and research on validation of neuro cognitive enhancing properties of various <laughs> plants. So may I request Professor uh, Tanuja Madam to address the gathering. Tanuja Madam. uh is dr tanuja nesri has she dropped out 
Okay. Um, okay, no problem. Uh, she's uh, traveling by train. Uh, so it's understandable that she may have lost uh, Wi-Fi connectivity. But we see our stalwart of fired with the Dr. Ashok Vedya Ji here. So instead, I am going to request Dr. Ashok Vedya to please say a few words of blessings for our, all of us before we begin with the panel sessions. Dr. Vedya Ji. Thank you, Pratibha. I think this is a major milestone in global health. And I think that Pratibha and her group's dedication and the Indian response to her has been amazing. And I believe that there are so many hits and leads waiting to be taken up further by building this Indo-US bridge. Because I personally believe in the discussion with MCI, discussion with several universities abroad, even Australian universities, we have found that there is a global appetite and hunger for not only correcting modern medicines, high tech and high cost, sometimes even indebting the whole family, but also for considering an alternative approach and epistemology for health. And I think that epistemology for health is very different in Ayurveda. And we must stay very, very much, Close. very much, I would say the word is that all the while we should not forget our epistemology. And that's why when you say Swastya is the Prasannata of Mana, Indriya, Atma, current science does not believe in Atma. And all our efforts of research are often Yukti Vapashre. Sattva Vajaya and Deva Vapashre are not attended to. But in US, there are outstanding studies on reincarnation, on karma, and these are done by very serious scientists. So I would say that our research angle should not only focus on plants, not only focus on some diseases where plenty of other available therapeutic measures are there, but we must focus on unique unique, uh, not only concepts, vision of Ayurveda, like Pragnaparat, like Vegavarod, and also our Panchakarma. Because if we understand the mechanistic understanding of Panchakarma with modern biochemistry, immunology, as well as molecular biology, we'll provide a great lead. Thank you, Pratibha, for these few words to share with you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ashok Vedeji, because your blessings are very, very important for all of us. Um, thank you for always supporting these kind of initiatives, which are, you know, very timely and we can't have too many of these. We need every bit of effort to streamline what the vision that we see for Ayurveda in a, in a proper uh, cohesive manner. So thank you so much. Just your presence, just to see you here is uh, very, very encouraging. Thank you so much. So uh, may I request panel number one to please come on video and uh, Dr. Anu and uh, Dr. Kishore, please take it away. Oh. Sure. Thank so you, thank Dr. You. Pratibha. I would like to introduce Dr. Kishore and Dr. Anupma. So they don't need any introduction, but very briefly, I would like the uh, August audience today to know that Dr. Kishore is currently working as the head department of Kriyashari Faculty of Ayurveda at BHU. He is also coordinator of Ayurveda Network, established with the support of the Ministry of Education and currently being supported by the Ministry of Ayush. His research work has been focused on Ayurveda education. 
and Dr. Anupma Kirakvetil. Uh, Anu is an Ayurvedic practitioner, licensed acupuncturist, professor and program director of Ayurvedic medicine at South Southern California University of Health Sciences. I invite you to, to kickstart the first panel. Uh, thank you, Dr. Vandala. Uh, Ayurvedic education has been uh, uh, a uh, rather uh, a topic of discussion or rather uh, also it has invited a lot of criticism because of uh, uh, the uh, several practices and uh, also the policies. So this has been a topic of hot debate since long. And uh, today we have uh, uh, our uh, panel, first panel on Ayurveda education which uh, uh, will be uh, uh, the participants of this panel would be uh, Professor Asmita Vele, Dr. Ramanohar, Dr. Ranjit Nimbalkar, Dr. Srivatsa and Dr. Julia Arnold. So let me introduce the panel uh, briefly. Uh, Professor Asmita Vele has earned her uh, BAMS and MD degrees, MDAY degrees from the University of Pune. She is the professor and head of the department of Rasa Shastra and Vaishya Kalpana Vignana at College of Ayurveda, Bharati Vidyapit Deemed University in Pune. Uh, she is also an honorary professor at University of Debrecen, Hungary. Her expertise lies in designing and execution of end-to-end -end research projects of Ayurveda formulations. Apart from standard formulations of Asava, Arishta, Taila, Herbo Minerals, she has also experience of making Purpati, Sindhura, Potali, Ab uh, Abhraka Sattva, and so on. She has been uh, the principal investigator of DST project, Ayush projects, and member of Ayush International Cooperation Committees of Scientific Advisory Committee of Gujarat Ayurveda University and Board of uh, Studies of Academic Council of Banas Hindu University, and so on. Uh, next in our panel is Dr. Ramanohar. Dr. P. Ramanohar, he received his BMS and MDMI degrees from Bharatiya University, Coimbatore and Rajiv Gandhi University of Health Sciences, Bangalore, respectively. He has been contributing in the field of Ayurvedic research for more than 25 years. Currently, he heads the school level research committee, Amrita School of Ayurveda, and also works as the director, Amrita Center for Advanced Research in Ayurveda. He is currently the principal investigator of Ayurcell project for evidence from clinical practice in Ayurveda, funded by Rashtri Ayurveda Vidyapit, Ministry of Ay Ayush, and Ayur Sim clinical simulations for undergraduate student training, uh, sponsored by Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology, and also is a member of Technical Committee Ayurveda Training and Accreditation Board (ATAB). Next in our panel is Dr. Ranjit Dimbalkar. He acquired his MD, AY, and PhD from uh, Maharashtra uh, Nashik MUHS in Roganidana and. Uh, uh, also, he has BA and MA in Sanskrit to his credit and uh, PGDCR in clinical research from ICRI Mumbai. He has got more than 20 years of teaching experience and also the research experience. He has worked at Cancer Research Project of Ayurved Hospital Research Center, Vaholi, Pune, and has worked as ICU registrar at Sanjeevan Hospital. And he has established, he is an established Ayurveda practitioner at Pune, he has visited US and Europe to deliver different lectures and his specialty happens to be cancer, PCOS, autoimmunity, obesity and psoriasis. And our next session, next panelist is Dr. Srivatsa. He is currently the professor and head PG department of Ayurveda Samhita and Siddhanta at Government Ayurveda Medical College Mysore. And he has completed his BMS from Government Ayurvedic Medical College Mysore and uh, MDAY from Gujarat Ayurveda University. He has completed uh, his PG diploma in yoga and procured Vidvat in Carnatic music. He is also an MSc holder in clinical nutrition and dietetics. He is currently working as professor and head in the department of postgraduate studies in Ayurveda Siddhanta Samhita, Government Ayurveda College Mysore since last 11 years. Uh, he has also worked at uh, Taranath Government Ayurveda College Bellari and he has guided many postgraduate students and uh, 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 works, postgraduate dissertation work since last nine years. Uh, the last panelist of our panel happens to be Dr. Julia Arnold. 
Julia T. Arnold, investigator at NIH and the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine, uh, um, United States. Uh, she is a program director at translational research program within the uh, DCTD, Division of Cancer Treatment and Diagnosis, NIC National Cancer Institute and supports the prostate and skin cancer uh, portfolios. Dr. Arnold obtained her PhD in experimental pathology, UNC School of Medicine, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Her postdoctoral training was in uh, uh, NCI Cancer and Cell Biology branch and uh, uh, with the Ho Johns Hopkins Oncology Center, Division of Experimental Therapeutics. Dr. Arnold was a staff scientist and lead investigator for 10 years at NIH, <coughs> National Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine, Intramural Laboratory, uh, Dr. Anon has gained scientific and technical expertise over 30 plus years, developing in vitro models in tissue microenvironment and cancer cell biology and cancer prevention, particularly as applied to hormonally related cancers inducing uh, endometrial and prostate. Following a position as a program officer with NCCAM extramural grants program, Dr. Arnold joined the NCID DCD, DCTD the Translational Research Program in 2011. And uh, Dr. Julia Arnold has published more than 30 peer-reviewed manuscripts and two book chapters and has been a member of the American Association of uh, for Cancer Research for more than 30 years. So now may I request uh, Dr. Anupama to continue with the panel discussion, coordinate the panel discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Kishore. Namaste, everyone. I welcome all the panelists here. Uh, I would like to jump into the question directly. So the first question under education panel is for Dr. Ramanohar. So what are the three key things that can be done to make Ayurveda students and graduates research oriented? Dr. <clears throat> Ramanohar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Anupama. Thank you uh, for inviting me to this panel. I'm very happy to see uh, you know, such a great initiative happening with participation of so many people. I just cannot help saying that before I answer your question. It was great to hear Ashok Vaidyaji's inspiring words also in the beginning. And uh, yes, I'm also happy to see Dr. Julia Arnold from NCI. So and of course, all others. Thank you. Sorry for taking a little time, you know, with these words. Now coming to the question, yeah, I think, you know, I'm going to basically emphasize one point and then, you know, explain it, saying three steps that we can take. It's that basically the change has to come at the way Ayurveda is studied. You know, in my frank opinion, I think the biggest problem why research is not really picking up in Ayurveda is because we think that research has is something that has to be brought from outside, from modern medicine. And this creates a kind of big divide. You know, on the one hand, you have Ayurveda, which you are studying from the texts and practice with a different attitude. And then you come to research from modern you know, perspective and students are finding it very difficult to relate these two things. So unless we inspire the students right from the beginning to understand that critical thinking is part of Ayurvedic learning, I mean, questioning is part of Ayurvedic learning, and that moving to modern methods of research is just, you know, an extension of what is already there within the tradition. I mean, this message is definitely not coming to the Ayurveda students. So, uh, I think the critical thinking that many modern researchers, scientists have been advising us to inculcate in Ayurveda, you know, is enshrined in the, in, in the whole Ayurvedic tradition, not only in Ayurveda, but also, so this is the first point I'm telling, you know, bring that criticality of thinking and questioning based on the traditional methods itself. Uh, so, like, even this was well known, even poets used to tell this, even spiritual philosophers had this idea of criticism. Kalidasa, we know, told that nothing that is traditional cannot be accepted just like that. And I was surprised, Adi Shankara is a spiritual philosopher. He says, 
if anything contradicts our direct observation, let it be even the Vedas don't accept. It. You know, how many, uh, how are we teaching our students these kind of, nobody knows about it. Adi Shankara, who was such a great propounder, supporter of the Vedic knowledge, he tells so bluntly that even if a hundred Vedic texts say that fire is cold and without light, I mean, nobody can accept it. So observation is primary. When there is a contradiction of Shruti by Pratyaksha, this means that observation was the primary method of learning and that has completely changed. Today we look at the texts, uh, nobody questions what is dosha, can I observe what is dosha? I mean, it's considered not right to even pose that question. And Charaka Samhita very clearly says that this is called Pariksha. Aptopadesha, we have also, I think, put Aptopadesha totally in the wrong perspective. Authoritative writing in Charaka Samhita is only a first step, you know, for expanding your knowledge. The Charaka Samhita always, so this is the second thing what I would like to point out is that not only should the text be studied critically, we must encourage students to think creatively from within the tradition. Today, when we talk about new knowledge, it means bringing modern scientific knowledge into Ayurveda. But Charaka Samhita says Anuktartatnyana that you can create new knowledge within the Ayurvedic tradition itself. I mean, that is not at all encouraged. So if this creates, and the third thing which I really would like to emphasize is, you know, that there is a method of validation within Ayurveda itself. So these three things can be brought and it is not something which we should bring when the students are in PG level or PhD level. I think in Ayurveda, this kind of a critical approach was encouraged right from the beginning. Kanadam, Paniniyam, Cha, Sarva This Ayurvedic method of Tarka or research, which is also, I think, one of the biggest problems like Padartha Vitnana is wrongly taught today as philosophy. Actually, all the Ayurvedic methods of research is there in Padartha Vitya. And if we, if we don't encourage Ayurvedic students to create this method of validation within the tradition, even to the extent of, you know, questioning the very validity, there is a method called Akshepa. Many people uh, find that questioning in our tradition means just clarifying. You know, I didn't understand, so please can you clarify? No. Questioning in our tradition means also Akshaba means complete refuted. I think students need to be able to come out of that shell. They should feel the freedom to, you know, question everything in the text. And that spirit can be brought from the classical text if they are presented in a different way. So this means that in order to achieve this, so I am telling what is the problem and you know that the solution is there in the text itself. And in order to solve this problem, we need to design a curriculum that brings in, you know, this, uh, I'm sorry, I'll just switch off the nice board. I'm very sorry about that. So that's the last point I would like to say, that this means that a group of people will have to sit very carefully and create a curriculum of Ayurveda that is based on this critical approach. You know, where we understand, this is the biggest problem, I think, when you say what is Prakriti, you want to study it using modern science, you, we don't actually, you know, first understand what is there in Ayurveda in its own terms. This is what I found when you say this is Rasadhadu, Rektadhadu, you all already make the correlation that it is blood and then you start your research. You know, uh, when I, I mean, this is the last point I would say, because I know that we are constrained for time. You know, if you really look at circulation of the, in Ayurvedic viewpoint, we know it's not blood that Ayurveda talks about, but Rasadhadu which is a very important distinction because Rasadhadu is something which goes out of your capillaries also. Blood, I mean, the blood cells don't go out. Ayurveda is talking about that plasma and it uses the word Rasa, distinguishes it from Rekta. So if we don't understand our concepts correctly first, how can you do research even with modern tools? So I think that is what needs to be brought in Ayurvedic education. Students should start thinking critically. I would say Ayurveda Upadesha Mimamsa should be done. Even if we say Vagbada said na Mimamsa, that has been put out of context. Vagbada said na Mimamsa under two conditions. When Pratyaksha Bhala Darshana, when it, oh, you have already evidence available mm -hmm. and authority, right. there are, you know, you have enough authorities who have verified it for you and you see the result. Otherwise, everything in Ayurveda should be considered Mimamsa. 
and if this spirit is brought in i think there will be a big uh, you know shift in thinking that we can expect more and there once this foundation is there you know we will be able in a better position to adopt what is good in modern research what is appropriate today this is the biggest challenge for an ayurveda uh, doctor even if we are willing to take modern research methods we don't know what will be appropriate to us which one we should take because we don't have a grounding in our own methods and our own approaches to research so thank you very much i think i will stop uh, thanks dr ramanohar ji so you are saying that in embed these three things like critical appraising skills or observation based knowledge as well as validity based method of validation based on ayurveda in ayurvedic curriculum from yes. the beginning itself to yes. encourage the students to research oriented Yes, that's exactly because you know how many people know that in Anumana we have study designs. You know, Puravat, Sheshavat, Samanya, To Drishta is nothing but you know the cohort designs of prospective, retrospective, cross-sectional. In Anumana, we have the Tripaksha knowledge of you know having controls, the trial arm, the positive control, and the negative control. In fact, Ayurveda always insisted that for Anumana to be proper, you must have positive and negative controls. so how, how are we thinking in this way charaka samhita says that every result he even uses a word pratinyamiki siddhi to distinguish real effect from you know chance effect which is what we are trying to do with uh, statistics today so if students learn this right from the beginning they'll be more open to modern methods and they have the discrimination to decide what kind of research approaches and models will be more suited for ayurveda i think that is where we are struggling now you know applying yeah. rcts in the wrong way or we don't know how to adapt the designs to ayurveda so this is what i mean you know by bring so this means we'll have to create a whole new curriculum it will be a very foundational work and even in modern students when they are taught evidence based approaches to ayurveda i mean because i am also experiencing that we always teach the modern methods i mean there is not even a foundational course telling them what is evidence in ayurveda so the students generally get the feeling that this is something to be believed you know and then you apply the evidence based approach and generate evidence out of it i mean that has to i think change otherwise we will not have really original thinkers we will not have ayurvedic people leading ayurveda research so that is if you look at the last 100 years research in ayurveda has been led by people outside the field of ayurveda all the great work that has happened for research so that thought, thought leadership in research if it should come within the ayurvedic community then i think this kind of a radical change in curriculum and education is you know very much needed thank you sir thank you very much so that being said so we we next question is for dr asmita so dr asmita you know uh, most of the education model especially in the medical education model globally moving towards a more evidence based education and evidence based practice right and so ayurveda is still in the emerging field in that with that concept so could you please share your thoughts what modification are needed to ayurvedic curriculum to make it more evidence based uh thank you anupama it's a, it's a really nice question and it is taking the discussion ahead so barring all formalities i'm just uh, picking up the point is yes, dr ram manohar ji very rightly pointed out that evidence for ayurveda should come from within the ayurvedic system and i find a catch here for last 30 years i am a teacher i am a learner also and before that when i was doing bms the problems are same after 30 35 years and that is our uh, sar point why the problems are similar it's because <coughs> this evidence which should emerge from the curriculum itself that curriculum has become very bookish that curriculum uh, is is given in schools at different levels in our uh, uh, in india there are the premier institutes there are colleges there are state uh, institutes there are private institutes and uh, you know the delivery of the curriculum is the challenge so policies are good very recently the ncism has uh, come up with a, a new policy and new curriculum new syllabus it will be implemented soon one and a half years the first year then second year then third year so 
and and there is a change towards you know ayurved should be taught in ayurvedic way that's correct but you cannot detach or dissociate yourself from the existing um, existing society existing knowledge system and therefore there is always going to be this bridging the two things the existing knowledge coming from basic sciences biology chemistry physics and their combinations and the existing ayurvedic knowledge which is the which is tradition which is flowing which is always encompassing whatever new comes in and grows so in in this uh, context i feel that evidence uh, we have to go ahead with whatever people are working and they are publishing they are creating evidences like ramanuvar ji has published a lot of work dr kishore has published a lot of work there are many ayurvedic as well as non ayurvedic and uh, those evidences if we want to inculcate in our education system then there are two ways to do it one is we should understand the difference between syllabus and curriculum syllabus gives you a guideline what all should be taught and curriculum a curriculum is a pathway how a particular thing should be taught now if i sit in the class and I ask the student this is nadi this is jalag this is hausagati this is manduka gati this is tarpa gati they are not going to understand so give a 10 minute presentation how to examine it and then ask them to examine and this can become a, uh, you know giving the understanding of nadi for different uh, healthy body i mean healthy people as well as the patients then the that syllabus point is covered well so these type of novel thing should be there when we want to incorporate evidence in the curriculum so this is the first point second point i want to um, highlight is the uh, you know like uh, again i'm taking from you uh, dr ramanuj ji the thing is it is everything is there in charak samhita in tarka sangraha but it is very very difficult to understand unless Uh, somebody in, immerses oneself into the whole knowledge from the language view point also and that is very difficult for the modern age students and now we are going towards you know you click on uh, on your mobile uh, phone and you can translate from english to slovak language slovak to uh, tamil language and then tamil to gujarati so you can translate any language on a click and here we are expecting students to learn the basic language of ayurveda i am full, fully for it huh? but i am just putting the problem uh, for the future generations now only uh, textbooks which will translate this knowledge using schematic diagrams using audio visual um, clips and then train them that would really create interest they will come back to i mean they will why i'm using this term come back because i want to make it a point that in spite of um visually such a large database of students and teachers and over 270 colleges of ayurved we are still talking of why there is no good institute why there is no you know remarkable research and why there is no impact and therefore everybody wants to go to the root now while doing this there are lot of on field issues and problems the other day we were discussing with a senior colleague of mine and we um, we came to the point that okay somebody has taken a bms degree and within 2 years he wants to support a family he or she she wants to earn for some for her at least to repay the clinics um, you know expenses is it really possible to sustain that much time period for that what how we are equipping our children our students so if that needs to be done then these all these points should come enter in the syllabus and then in the curriculum so that that evidence will come from within as for now this will be my third point probably last as of now whatever researches uh, you know 
when you go to the schools i mean ayurvedic colleges and school you will find that uh, any text book you pick up it is just a translation of that shlok and there is some some translation is written sometimes there are some tables and some measurements or some description okay but that is there any validity for example we are talking of research methodology if you take research methodology curriculum of fourth year bms that means now from this year onwards it will be third year bms last year paper uh, previously till this time point uh, it was a fourth year paper if you see the syllabus the flow is very distorted you know for for a person who is thinking from modern medicine or healthcare perspective they knew research only as clinical research for ayurveda we also want to do some literary research regarding understanding our concepts we also want to go into uh, uh, experimental research using the modern terms like systems biology and other tools so are we equipping our students to do that how do we inculcate those you know the nuances there so knowledge source is huge our science is also a traditional science which gives you lots of skills but when we want to merge them together we really need to have a robust basic matrix where uh, how these ayurvedic concepts could be translated into a student friendly for that matter user friendly um, language using different technical tools and then the evidence should be generated meanwhile if there is a text then that that portion of the text it should be appended with the information that has come up uh, here the whole i mean the whole group is uh, here and uh, okay let us just take a example of prakriti so while teaching prakriti at bms level who takes cognizance of the work profound work that has gone into professor ram manohar ji's uh, publications bhavana prasher ma'am's publications and many others there are five wonderful publications who relate to this concept of prakriti and give importance are our physiology teachers equipped to teach this if that doesn't come in our textbook it's not going to come to the classroom and if that's not going to come to the classroom students are going to take a easy way out and practice modern medicine and there is no uh, research attitude at all it doesn't remain as for my experience goes with now students coming in are through neat they are good students they are equipped with the modern techniques of physics chemistry biology even all the instrumental techniques they are introduced to they are good with uh, the gadgets they are good with you know communication and other things so are we going to take help of whatever existing knowledge they have and then try to um, re look at our content and the thinking of research critical thinking analysis that is what i think we should uh, we should, should be able, then only we should be able to bring in um, evidence in our curriculum so curriculum should not be only classroom based not teacher centric it should be more and more student centric they should be given activities to do they should be given uh, you know that uh, like kind of out of classroom out of theory kind of things that all should fit in this curriculum and thankfully the new curriculum is at least designed with this motive i am not sure how people are going to implement it and i'm worried about it because uh, it happens like the policy makers do their job putting the heads together thinking of 15 20 years down the line for future but at the implementation level individual things start coming in they percolate and when a, a, a research teacher from any college uh, you know start he looks at the syllabus point number 1 um point number 1 descriptive research one method point number 2 um spectrophotometry and they 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 teach research in this manner and that's my pain because then nobody understands uh, where to use what so cmes are created to do this cmes are also rashi ayurved vidyapeeth has done a commendable job in last two years 
they have created different modules in CME and they are coming up with good things. But uh, at ground level, a lot of work needs to be done to empower our teachers, which will percolate to the students, particularly for research. Thanks, so, Dr. Asmita. Uh, so thank you very much uh, for inviting me here and Dr. Anupama for talking to me and, and my respects to all participants and seniors here, Ashok Vaidyan sir also. Yeah, <clears throat> thanks, Dr. Asmita. So what you're saying now is maybe we need to come up with the syllabus and curriculum where the student learning outcome is embedded with the evidence-based education and practice. And you're hoping that the new curriculum which we have created, at some extent, we already have that. And we have to now look at, at the implementation level. Yep. OK, thank, thank you, Dr. Asmita. So our next question is, <clears throat> so it is a continuation of the uh, Dr. Asmita's question. So the, now we have the curriculum now with the new NCISM has introduced the new curriculum. It looked like. For some extent, we have included evidence-based education and evidence-based practice within the curriculum. So, but there may be some challenge among the faculty who are not trained in it. So the next question is for Dr. Srivasa. So how can we orient or educate and update the faculty on basic research method? Because we need to implement this at the education level. So only the main tool what we have the faculty how to be have enough training to give this to the students, right? So what are your thoughts on it? Dr. Ranjit, I'm sorry, Dr. Srivasta. Uh, namaste. No. There is no much difference regarding research orientation from the point of the student and from the point of uh, faculty. Uh, I want to talk uh, from the basic level, which is very important. And for every action, three components are uh, required very much. The first one, uh, we call it as estimation. The second one, we call it as uh, execution. The third one, we call it as evaluation. We all know this. The same thing has been uh, reflected very beautifully in Tarkasim Hita. I won't talk about all those issues today because my point is exclusively focused on faculty training, which is very important. So from this point, uh, when we look into the research status uh, uh, from the point of the faculty, what I personally feel is, uh, we should basically focus on three important components uh, which are neglected at most. The first one is the literature. The second one is dravya, uh, that is drug. The third one is the tradition. Many points have been neglected from the uh, view of uh, literature. I want to focus on this uh, significantly because uh, when we look into certain subjects, uh, we read the subject from the point of two or three ticks like that. But as we all know, we have more than one lakh medical manuscripts, which are not at all explored till today. We are restricting ourselves only towards a certain texts. It might be like Charaka Samhita, Shushuka Samhita, Sangha Samhita, and so on. Few texts. Uh, one example, let me quote here. When we look into the concept of Anupana, it is mentioned in Charaka Samhita in one context with a brief description. Later, it has been progressed to a text called as Anupana Darpanam, which is available today. So like that, when we look into different uh, subjects, all the subjects, they are in the form of uh, seeds in some meters. Later, they are developed to the form of uh, speciality. And we have this vast literature, uh, which has not been explored properly because of which many times in the field of research, we are facing uh, many challenges because we take up research with few references like, occasionally, with one reference many times because of which we could not be able to get appropriate research outcome. We cannot, we are not able to provide appropriate uh, research orientation at any point of time. So there is need to sensitize people, sensitize especially the faculty regarding this treasure of literature, which is very important. The second point I want to highlight here is Dravya, knowing about the Dravya, and keeping the resource of Dravya properly, which is very important. And simple example, let me tell. If government demands the faculty of Ayurveda to cultivate or to provide Amruta, that is Guruji, to the people of whole nation, do we able to provide that? 
do we have that much of production of guru chi so this is the biggest challenge what we are talking about we are talking about the efficacy of so many drugs we are talking about chemical composition of so many drugs but basically what about the available so we should be sensitized about this one to the faculty which is very important one because faculty is going to build up the research scholars later faculty is going to build up the uh, ayurveda practitioners later so there is a need to sensitize about the resource a drug which is very important one moving on to the third point that is a tradition which is very important when we have many traditions uh, which are practicing ayurveda very systematically uh, very appropriately as based on the practice but how many such traditions have been brought to the limelight there is a need to keep alive these traditions which is very important and so when we do all these things first then we can talk about uh, the level of execution and the, the level of evaluation so i'm just highlighting the level of uh, the first one planning which is very important and that is estimation so how we can move far, uh, further uh, with this prepare uh, preparedness that i want to highlight is four important stages the first level we should sensitize the faculty about this issue which is very important one in second step uh, we should educate them in such a way that they should try to collect uh, all these uh, requirements very appropriately in third step we should go for sensitization sorry hands on training but usually what we are doing we are directly starting hands on training first because of which uh, we are not getting the expected result so hands on training should be our third level uh, which is very important one the fourth level should be updating the program or uh, reorientation program so when we do this periodically when we do this repeatedly then i think uh, we can train the faculty properly we can orient the faculty properly uh, for the basic research because all the branches of ayurveda they are dependent on these main resources but somewhere we are not realizing we are not sensing uh, the importance of these resources so let us try to realize the importance of these resources that is shastra uh, dravya and prayoga so when we realize the importance of shastra dravya prayoga when we sensitize the faculty first about this then we can move on to the next two stages that is uh, execution as well as evaluation as we are at germination level uh, i don't want to talk about the next two stages uh, we will talk about that later uh, at this point of time i just want to highlight this one uh, let us try to explore shastra extensively uh, let us try to understand dravya exactly uh, let us try to preserve uh, tradition very appropriately that is prayoga very appropriately hopefully we can move on to the uh, next step Uh, exactly next up very systematically with this word let me conclude my words thank you thanks dr srivas so <clears throat> what's your what are your thoughts on how to implement this like you explained about four different way of approaching yeah. the situation but right. is the institution take the responsibility to implement the faculty to go through this training or who will be the person or how can we implement this is a great great plan and great thoughts really help faculty to prepare but how it do we see that it should start from the effort of everyone everyone should join hands together then only it can be done it should start from the effort of everyone everyone should put effort from his side uh, it might be related with collection of literature it might be related with preserve, preservation of correct that's what i said uh, okay. i don't want to talk about execution now huh. because we are at the germination stage at this level we should talk only about uh, the planning estimation so i'm talking about that one so my concern at this point is only to preserve it first only to collect it first then i will talk about the second two stages now i cannot talk about it okay. so this is not the point i am very particular about this one i am very specific about this one i am today highlighting only the level of estimation thank you thank you so much <clears throat> so then thank the next next question is continuation of that part so we have the new curriculum new curriculum now and cim and cism introduced the new curriculum and also introduced now the research methodology this 
it was there before also, but I believe now it is in third year, right? So what are uh, next questions for Dr. Renji? So Dr. Renji, what, is, what are your thoughts on, is there is a need of research project as an elective course for Ayurvedic student in the BAMS program? Uh, Dr. Renjit, I think you are on mute. Now, okay. Yeah, now we can. Hello. Yeah. Thank you. So, first of all, namaste to all. And uh, thanks for this uh, opportunity to present my view. So, if we begin from the very beginning, now the question is about research project for BMS students. But if we begin from the very beginning, we know that need is the mother of research. And in Ayurveda also, it is mentioned that Prayojanavat Tantra. So why to do this all should be the prime concern. If the person knows that I want to do these all much, this thing or this type of exercise for, and I will be benefited in this manner, then only it will come from within. And if it is compared that, okay, you have to do this, this research X, Y, Z, then these types of research are even done in MD or PhD curriculum as well. But we know exactly what is the reality. So I think uh, very grassroots level, what is the exact need of research? Should be, first we must think about it. We all, uh, if we are policy makers, we means policy makers. And once when we are clear, then we can make uh, some type of introduction for that in the first year or even before that, you can say. So that is one thing. And again, why all this thing to do? As uh, Asmita Madam rightly said, that the students which are coming to Ayurveda, they have passed NEET, NEET examination. And uh, before that, first to 12th standard, they have learned all science, which we mean day-to-day uh, -day science, physics, chemistry, biology, even human physiology, all those things. And when the student comes to Ayurveda, then suddenly there is a paradigm shift. Suddenly we talk about Panchama, Bhutas and Atma and Dhatu and Dosha. And it is really very difficult for that student to digest all these uh, radical change in concepts. So whatever concepts we are talking about, we uh, first need to create uh, some evidence for that. And then only we can talk about some evidence base. Not only always that there, there can be drug and uh, result type of research is necessary. We sh should not assume that. There are many things explained in Ayurveda. For example, there are many epidemiological things. It has been told that Ratra uh, Jagranam Ruksham or Snigdam Spraswapanam Diva or Brahme Murta Uttishthe or Viruddhana is there or Ati Jalapan. So, to my knowledge, I don't have any means uh, epidemiological studies which can be at par with this NYHA, which was a heart epidemiological study for years together. And these types of study actually should be started from our side. And once we are talking that, okay, you should get up at Brahma Murta, not just because it is told by the text, but we have this data that so many thousands of people who were getting up at Brahma Murta have benefited like this and those who are not getting up have not benefited. So evidence base can be created in each and everything. One more thing is uh, there is a lot of Apta Praman as uh, our first speaker had already uh, told about that. We have a lot of Apta Praman over there and our uh, text they uh, advocate both. Sometimes they say, as Sir had already said, Mantravat Samprayokta Vyam Nami Katanjana. So you are not needed to use your brains. Just do as directed. So this type of thought process also we can see. And at the same time, in the same text, we see verses like Kuriya Duyam Soyam Diya or Yunjat Tadvida Manyacha Dravyam Jayat Ayogikam sort of thing. So use your brains. Like that also our texts are saying. In Charak Samhita Vimansan 8th chapter, it is said that Siddhanta. So what is a Siddhanta? He says, a Siddhanta nama saha yaha parikshakair bahuvidam pariksha. Now parikshakair is a plural. So many examiners. 
बहुविधम परीक्षा सो मेनी टाइप्स ऑफ एक्सामिनेशन हेतु पिष्ट साधयित्वा अगेन इट्स कॉज एंड इफेक्ट रिलेशनशिप मस्ट बी एस्टॅब्लिश अँड स्थापते निर्णय सो दिस सिद्धांत इज नथिंग बट अवर टुडेज रिसर्च मेथडॉलॉजी सो कॉज अँड इफेक्ट अँड ऑल टाइप ऑफ एक्झामिनेशन वेदर इट इज रिअली लाईक स कॉक्स पॉस्ट्युलेट्स आय वाईल टीचिंग आय युज टू गिव्ह एक्झाम्पल ऑफ कॉक्स पॉस्ट्युलेट्स विच आर देअर फॉर टू प्रूव्ह दॅट the same disease has been uh, caused by that particular organism there are four different postulates so siddhanta is similar to that so if we want to give any research projects to the student now i didn't understand whether we are talking about ug student or a pg student if uh, in pg student anyway they are taking some research project so uh, i took for granted that we are talking about a ug student so for a ug student i think there can be two three ideas like right from the first year till their internship they can be given a project for say four five years not only research is actually a lifetime job we people uh, while doing md or phd we finish it in six months one year and what not so right from first year if the student is being given some project for four five years and that should be necessarily epidemiological study because right from first year they are not aware about the disease and drug and what are the protocols but this is very simple thing uh, let's say we can talk about uh, we can make a group of students say five to six students in one group and we can allot them there are thousands and millions of topics which can be given for research for example say viruddhan so if people are using uh, eating viruddhan or something like that then you have to uh, identify say 10 or 100 or 500 whatever number of people for that group and uh, they should follow all these people for at least 5 years and uh, take their uh, history that can be taught to them or uh, pg students can prepare some good pro forma and give this to the students to fill them up so that they will go through this research project and uh, they will get a uh ground idea so what is exactly happening and of course there will be some research experience for these people also for the students and the biggest thing is that there can be good data all over india so again we come to viruddhan say milk and fruits so fruit salad or shikran as we call it banana with milk so all to all over india if uh, all the students are given this topic maybe consecutively for four five years also so lots of thousands and 10000 lakhs of uh, people will be enrolled in that and at least five years down the line we, we can have some data it can also be done that if this uh, four and five year four and a half year of that particular student is finished so this project can be handed over to new batch and they will continue following them up for next 4 5 years so what is happening which diseases are coming in those patients and this type of data for so many parameters there is a brahme murta utishthet is there or vega dharan is there that is also a good thing daily abhyang or lots of sadvrutta things are there daily nasya so these people can be followed for 10 15 20 years and uh, this can be done unitedly so if we really want to inculcate this research project in our curriculum i think uh, this one can be the key thing to do and uh, but definitely before that prayojanavat tantram what is the need of this what is the use of this just because it is told in text and you have to follow it my means we have learned in this way so practically jam problem i think i sanjay mala ve kolot us computer jam trouble deto hai dr rao can you mute yourself yeah 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 i am not able to mute that's the problem i am facing i'm muting you thank you okay so, sorry uh, go ahead yeah uh, dr anjit i think you are on mute <clears throat> now okay yeah yeah now we can hear Yes, yes. Yeah. So, so thanks, yeah. Dr. Ranjit. So what, what I'm understanding from you is it is the time for us to introduce the research uh, project in, within the curriculum, an early part of BAMS curriculum. 
so that we can have the uh, our graduates and later faculty with more research oriented and there are plenty of topic it's just a matter of you know introducing this apart from the research methodology class it also will add more value if we introduced research project within the curriculum right yeah. thank you thank you so much dr ranjit so the thank next you. question Next question is for Dr. Julia. Um, doc, you know, Ayurveda is globally, you know, profoundly growing. We can see, and outside India, more Western educator, Western medical educator professionals, or other healthcare professionals, uh, you know, other uh, trained in other healthcare modalities, are interested in learning Ayurvedic medicine. And integrative Ayurveda is slowly growing throughout the uh, different in different countries. So that being, that will play a major role in the growth of Ayurveda. Mm. So that being, looking into that as a, one of the important influence for the growth of Ayurveda, how can we train or how can we develop more research-based curriculum or research mechanism for creating a curriculum to educate the biomedical uh, scientist or by, uh, other practitioner about Ayurveda? Thank you, Dr. Anu. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, Thank great. You. It's a real honor to be with you all today. Um, and I'll be very brief. Um, so while we've been discussing how to support research and training for Ayurvedic students, I, as you say, it's very important for us to build education about Ayurveda for the allopathic Western biomedical scientists to help them understand what Ayurveda is and why it's important to integrate the knowledge into current healthcare and enhance global wellness. I think of many of the people that I work with or, or we give money out to many researchers, um, many have here in the US have never even heard of Ayurveda and we have a lot to learn. Um, so I'm very impressed with all of the developing programs that you have in your institutions already to develop your scientists and your, your students. I'm just, and I don't have any answers, but I, I'm just wondering how could we leverage some of that ongoing medical school, Ayurvedic medical school curriculum in India to help develop perhaps an introductory set of lectures tailored to Western scientists. Um, first of all, I think they'd be really overwhelmed with the Sanskrit terms. So it would have to be sort of gentle in that area. Um, uh, the lectures could translate some of these basic concepts and provide potential applications for healthcare or clinical research. So I think it would be a, a way to develop more interest in this knowledge because once people understand what it is, it's very exciting and um, deeply moving to want to, to understand more and help these researchers to dig deeper into the efficacy of Ayurvedic medicine for their practices. So could we also perhaps have an international CME lectures of sorts to present some of the rigorous research already going on, show examples of clinical applications, and then probe into potential mechanisms of how that might be working, having to go back to some of the basic concepts of Ayurveda to say, well, this is working here because of you know, whatever those basic concepts are. So that's another way that uh, researchers could learn the basic concepts. So maybe we can think ahead for a five-year plan or so. Somehow can we develop for the next generation, build a medical school curriculum about Ayurveda in, well, in the US or globally. So I think there's many people here on the panel today that have this great experience in this area that help, could help coordinate such a program. And I'd be excited to see how that comes out. So I will continue to listen and learn as we all do. Thank you so much. Thanks, Dr. Julia. I really like the idea of creating the international CME for educating this uh, you know, uh, Western trained practitioner or other healthcare modalities trained practitioner. Mm -hmm. And most of the integrative medicine fellowship programs here in the US already have the Ayurveda as one of their uh, subject curriculum. But the, within that curriculum, what they have done is everything is based on research. It'll be great to have, we have a lot of great scientists here. They all have published a lot and maybe mm -hmm. creating a curriculum based on the top research 
and then identify right. correlating that with the ayurvedic basic principle or in a foundational principle will be really great to educate and motivate the other healthcare professionals in the field of ayurveda great thank, thank you, so you. Namaste. Yeah, thank you i think we have completed all the questions for the education panel thank you very much I really wanted to thank everyone for you know participating in this panel and i think towards the end if we have more questions we can take at that point thank you very much So I'll come in just for briefly, and then we're going to invite Dr. Tanuja, who is here now. So uh, first of all, thank you, Dr. Anu, for hosting the panel, moderating it uh, beautifully, and Dr. Kishore, and all of the panelists, amazing insights and ideas, which will provide direction. So I have taken a lot of notes, and we have actually volunteer note takers who are actually taking copious notes. Um, and then we have some chats going on. So all of that is being noted. And uh, just to quickly summarize, I think um, the September event that happened, happened with a focus on two big aspects of Ayurveda. One is products, one is practice. So the products part was covered under the industry roundtable, out of which the industry conclave has been birthed. And the first meeting of the industry conclave, which is again a forum like this, a closed forum, which will be meeting on a quarterly basis. The first meeting has happened in January. And the second thing that was birthed out of that September event, uh, the practice focused uh, side of things was the global consortium under which we are meeting for the first time again today. And again, this is uh, envisioned to be a quarterly meeting where we can carry out some action items from like today's meeting, we can um, reconvene on those points in meeting number two. So providing a continuum of thought and energy. So I think today, just to summarize, I think a lot of very valid points have come and we will take up some points in the open forum in the last hour. But in the interest of just moving forward, I'll just summarize quickly and then invite Dr. Tanuja Nesri to say a few words. Um, I think we have talked about what, first of all, in-house, um, dive deep and discovery and identification and outlining and bringing to the fore what is present within Ayurveda in terms of research, in terms of basic principles, and then bringing in the outside current knowledge and then creating that connection. For example, circadian rhythm, we have enough data in today's date. How do we connect it with our very first shloka, Swastavrata, Brahme Murte Uttishtet? Why is it relevant? Why is, how is it now proven? So I think we talk about, a, about research a lot, but we do not talk enough about um, creating the scientific temperament within our student body. It doesn't matter if it's a postgraduate level student body, but this scientific temperament is still missing very, very uh, noticeably. And even in the practitioner and the uh, teaching academic community as well. So I think these are some of the things we have to mull very well and Dr. Ram Manoharji made some really great points of what is available within our own uh, uh, sciences, our own samitas. Um, Dr. Uh, Srivatsa ji, Dr. Nimbalkar, Dr. Asmita Vele, you all made great points about what is there in our own treatises. So many manuscripts are unexplored. So we should... Um, not only look for the new things, but also uh, discover and bring to the fore what we do have. I don't think we are using what we have enough. I think all of you will agree. So I think we need to discover what we have. We need to consolidate what we have done. That is also a big gap. Half of you know what the literature has been published is not being brought into the teaching and uh, awareness of the Ayurvedic student community practitioner community as well, research community as well. So I think many, many gaps are there. This is just a beginning of that effort. So we have just uh, concluded the 
um, education panel. Now we are, uh, we, we'll have Dr. Tanuja Nesri say a few words, and then we'll move on to the research panel, and then the innovation panel. Uh, Dr. Tanuja, yes, please. Yes, thank you. Go ahead. Yes. Thank you. At the outset, uh, I have really expressed my sincere apology that I'm traveling and I'm not able to connect. But I'm, I was very happy and fortunate to listen to the great views starting from Honorable CS Dr. Amar Mentor Ashok Vaitichi, followed by Dr. Ram Mono, Asmita, uh, and uh, Nibarkar. And uh, it's a great moderation done by Anu Ji. And um, uh, yourself, Dr. Pratibha, thank you very much. I'll not take much time, uh, but I just uh, want to uh, ex <clears throat> ex the, the idea behind this curriculum change, because I was a part of this change process. I witnessed the change process because he showed what was done. And Ash Ashwin Rauji and many other our senior members, they are present in this August gathering. So uh, actually, uh, this is a competency-based education program as like a MCI it is done. Uh, but uh, few, many, many, many uh, sessions are being uh, conducted and the brainstorming is done as what we are doing. Am I audible, Pratibha, Dr. Pratibha? Hello? Hello? Yes, yes, you yes, are, you yes, are, sorry. yes. Okay, 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 thank you. So it is the Vaidya Lakshana, Vaidya Gunas, that is a graduate attribute, which we are first considered. Uh, the basic question is why we want to change the curriculum, and if at all, how it should be, and for what we should do. So Vaidya Gunas, it should, he should be Drushta Karma, he should be Jigyasu, he should be. So, all those Vajra Gunas have been collected, had been collected, and its correct understanding was done. And if that becomes our program outcome at the graduation level, if we really want to, want to have our student and we want to see him as a competent, competent as a good Chikitsak. If we want him to develop these skills and competency skills to be a good researcher, to be a good communicator, to be a good uh, public health educator and the health leader and to cater the industry, then all those gunas which are inbuilt in our own shastra have to be uh, have collated together. Curriculum has been rebuilt and more important is as we understand the teaching itself is a science it is as Vaidya, uh, uh, our mentor Vaidhiji said that new teaching pedagogy needs to be again developed it is within our own science as dr ramanot said that tattva shastra and devar and all our sahitas are not only the knowledge base just they give us the Padartha Vidyana and the principle, but those are the outcome of the many, many years research done by our ancient scientists, our Acharyas. The outcome of the experimentation. Sorry about that. Dr. Tanuja is actually traveling to Jhansi right now. Okay. Sorry, Dr. Tanuja, we are losing you. Hello. Yes, you're back. You're back. I'm back. Okay. So, sorry, interruption. So, I'll conclude in a short. But the only thing is, uh, whatever the text, the Samhitas are, the outcome of the research experimentation, those are the Siddhantas. So we have to learn how to read these Samhitas, what was the methodology of the experimentation. For example, my friend Srivatsam mentioned about the drug research, drug research. Metrologen, 
examination of the dravya then there is a examination method of uh, uh, study new diseases in krumi khan krumi uh, vimana in how do we so it in the shastra itself methodology of experimentation clearly mentioned now is a time to reconnect in the current perspective the vyavahar that was shastra and vyavahar needs to be done so in this teaching pedagogy new teaching pedagogy when it is competency based curriculum you may see that there is a uh, there is a compulsion of choosing uh, not compulsion but nine electives are mandatory so one is ethnically uh, different parts of research methodology for the drug research fundamental research for that vigyan and relevant sciences so uh, i think uh, this change may be if it is taken very well and it is percolated how it needs to be i think it would bring a good change and maybe develop the skills in our graduates as a graduate attribute by the lakshana by the guna that's what we want to really inculcate begin and the vaidya is keeping on to a good physique good result then from the first day the first day of its graduation of the thing from the one side that is the whole state to be inbuilt it's what be done uh, as a learning outcome and that what exactly i mentioned that uh, i know some that the shadow guru with the shatter vachan which Yeah, unfortunately, the connection is really bad. Oh, I think Dr. Tanuja dropped out. So we will request her to probably record her thoughts and send to us, and I will share with everybody who is registered. Um, so, in the interest of time, I'm going to invite uh, Dr. Kishore to introduce the next panel, please. And we'll try to keep the introductions brief so that. Yeah, sure, sure. So, thank you. Next panel will be. Uh, coordinated by Dr. Akash Kimhavi ji and uh, Dr. Supriya Bhalera, and uh, uh, you have already introduced uh, Dr. Akash. So I am going to introduce Dr. Supriya Bhalera. Uh, Dr. Supriya uh, currently works as an associate professor at Interactive Research School of Dr. Health Kishore. Health. Sorry, uh, sorry, one second, Dr. Tanuja. Sorry, very sorry, you would dropped. Out. You had dropped out. Is it okay? We proceed with the next panel, Dr. Tanuja. Sorry, she has just joined. Dr. Tanuja Nesri. Okay, never mind. Please go ahead. Sorry, sorry about that. Yeah, I'm. I'm there. Uh, I think. Uh, I mean, if there is interruption, so I just wish all the best, uh, Pratibha ji, and it's great going. But the only thing is, I just wanted to say that it is a competency-based education program, and. Um, why it did not happen because the first year it is we exactly followed the western culture like first year non clinical then para clinical and the third year clinical but now it is a samhita based learning if we the first year itself we take our students to the clinic because earlier it was a kulaguru like gurukul system and we made it into kulaguru system and exactly followed the same as the uh, allopathy follows but if we really go back to our uh, gurukul system and first year itself is a early exposure the typical that, that is the way how it is done and the teachers need to be trained because the teacher are the one are the key key factor if they are being sensitized they, they are being oriented then i'm sure that could be, uh, that could be because the teachers replica is the one which students teacher are the role model so more more and more uh, tots are to be prepared so with all these things i just last word is a teaching pedagogy that is a learning management system and the new normal after the covid needs to be followed that's what i just because tradition supported with the technology will make our classical knowledge get contemporary in this world thank you very much A lot of disturbances, but thank you for bearing with me. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Tanuja ji. And uh, tradition with technology, I think that's, let's all make a note of that. I think that um, says it all, says a lot, actually. So thank you so much. I think... Teaching uh, technology, teaching technology, research technology, very important to inculcate in our own uh, system. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. So... Um, again, very heartening to see a lot of new thought process coming in into teaching as well as how to bring in research mindset into the Ayurveda fraternity. So it's very, very encouraging. I hope um, we will be able to um, outline some really concrete next steps to provide, to continue to support and provide uh, a continuity and a cohesion to the uh, to the vision of of bringing about this change in 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 our mindsets as students practitioners teachers the entire fraternity so um, thank you dr tanuja for joining from uh, your train uh, it, was, it, it was challenging but we managed it thank you so much um, dr kishore over to you thank you yeah sure so I was introducing Dr. Supriya Bhallarao actually, and uh, uh, she currently works as an associate professor at the Interactive Research School of Health Affairs, Irsha Bharti Vidya Pit Deemed University, Pune. And she has uh, many diplomas and degrees to her credit, including MD, AY, PhD, AY, uh, MA, PG diploma in clinical research and PG diploma in bioethics from different universities. She has also received special training in biostatistics, including systematic reviews and meta-analysis and techniques in molecular biology and pharmacogenomics. Uh, in the past, she has worked as a research officer at uh, Dr. Sharadini Dahanukar Advanced Sir, Center. I think, uh, Dr. Kishore, I think uh, yes. uh, we should move ahead because sure. we all are sure. already late. Sure, please, please. Yeah, so, take care. Thank we, you very much. Okay, namaste, namaste everyone. Uh, after the uh, thought-provoking first panel, myself and Dr. Supriya will be moderating the second panel, which is about research design. Uh, we have with us uh, distinguished uh, speakers, uh, Dr. Ashwini Kumar Raut, Dr. Abhinarayan Acharya, Dr. Unni Krishnan, Dr. Girish Tillu, and Dr. Suhash Shetty. Uh, Dr. Ram Rao was supposed to join us, but Unfortunately, he's not able to join. So uh, if I can request the host to kindly bring them on the screen, Dr. Ashwini Kumar Rawat, uh, Dr. Abhinarayan Acharya, and Dr. Unni Krishnan, Dr. Girish Tillu, and Dr. Suhash Shetty. So education, uh, we have heard so far, what are the challenges and how research and the curriculum has to be designed. So now we go to the next step is about the research designs. And the one point that has been uh, very you know, clearly highlighted in the first panel is that there is a need for a mindset change, both at the policy level and as well as the faculty and at the student level and how this can be done. And more about uh, you know, uh, bringing evidence in our teaching and in making Ayurveda truly global. So in this panel, we have distinguished speakers so the first speaker I would like to uh, introduce is Dr. Ashwini Kumar Raoji. He is an Ayurveda consultant and investigator from Mumbai. He reinforces Ayurveda with latest research developments in his clinical practice of over three decades. He is currently engaged as a co-principal investigator of ICMR sponsored product development center for phyto uh, pharmaceuticals. And he is also involved in Ayush CSIR COVID-19 project in the capacity of joint clinical coordinator and consultant to Ayush CCRS Center in Mumbai. So I'm cutting short your bio for uh, want of time, kindly excuse me. Uh, so with regards to the research design, the question that uh, we want you to answer is, what are some challenges or gaps in our approach to research in Ayurveda in either identifying or designing the research, which can become the benchmark for you know, research in Ayurveda and taking ahead the base of education that we have so far discussed. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Akash, for that brief introduction. 
Uh, I must thank Dr. Pratibha for arranging this interesting uh, discussions, a group discussion, and also Dr. Supriya, who to whom I talk in the morning to understand what exactly is expected from this discussion. Uh, so without wasting much time, uh, the title given to assigned to me is what are challenges or gaps in our approach to research in Ayurveda dash identifying and designing. So I have divided this uh, sentence into three. So three problems you have asked, challenges and gaps in approaches to research in Ayurveda. Second, identifying the problem of research in Ayurveda. And third, designing the research project in Ayurveda. So in next five to seven minutes, we'll quickly go through this three highlighted challenges and gaps what we are facing currently. So coming to the first, the approaches to research in Ayurveda. Now there are several approaches of research in Ayurveda have been proposed. To quote a few and prominent one are golden triangle approach. Then evidence-based medicine approach to Ayurveda. Pragmatic trial and whole system management approach. And the most dear to us is reverse pharmacology and therapeutic approach, which we follow at our center at Kasturba Health Society's Medical Research Center. And we have many success stories for that. But without going into the details of these, these the problem or the challenges are that we need to comprehend the vision of these approaches. And also, we need to understand the potential applicability of these approaches. So these all approaches, we are, we, we, in earlier session, we talked about the uh, education and research and educational programs and training programs. I think all these research methodology programs which are being uh, imparted to our students, we should never forget of training them with all these approaches with its proper vision being understood and imparted to the all the participants and also showing them the potential applicability of these different approaches. All these approaches are valuable and excellent. We also have had research programs like science initiative in Ayurveda, Ayurveda informatics and electronic data systems, IU soft program we had, Prakruti genomics and pharmacogenetics and pharmacovigilance and pharmacoepidemiology studies. Now it is beyond uh, scope for this uh, talk to expand on each of them. But I like to just highlight the shortcomings or what we say, the challenges we have faced in the pharmacovigilance program. Now Ayurved itself, the strong point or USP of Ayurved is the safety of our products. And if you start talking about pharmacovigilance just by you know, taking like the modern medicine approach, it's not going to succeed. Instead of that, the approach which was suggested by Dr. Ramavaidya Bhushan Patwardhan and the group, Ayurvedic pharmacology, pharmacology approach and observational therapeutic approach. If we take that approach at a larger scale, then I think it is not only the policing of what has been uh, recorded, but also finding what are the new hints and leads we get from the clinical practice or the community practices of Ayurvedic system of medicine. Second uh, problem, what we are we have highlight, uh, highlighted through, through this uh, question is identifying the problem of research in Ayurveda. Now, whenever we want to identify the problem of research in Ayurveda, we must do the SWOT analysis of Ayurveda as a healthcare system. What are its strengths? What are the weaknesses? What are the opportunities and what are the threats? If you see the strengths of Ayurveda, actually when it comes to the clinical application, non-communicable diseases management is the biggest strength of Ayurveda over the current existing mainstream medicine. If you see, the disease preventive approach, somebody talked even, I think Asmita talked about Swastavruta and its application. You know? So that is the biggest strength of Ayurveda. Also, 
health promotive rasayan chikitsa of ayurved is our strength rasayan and vajikaran both in fact what are our weaknesses communicable diseases infectious diseases we cannot compete with the current antimicrobial agents and we tried to do that in the covid and we miserably failed we must understand that why it had happened our another weakness is product standardization our third weakness is uniformity in the protocols even prakruti protocol if for for that sake there is no uniformity ayush has definitely come out with the prakruti protocol but still it has not reached to everyone and it should be very precise concise operable in a clinic and very short and then again the objective assessment objective assessment of our protocols is another uh, challenge what we face what opportunities we have uh, vaidya sir said besides yukti vapashray satva vajay and dava vapashray chikitsa are unexplored areas of ayurved but what are those what we should take dharaniya adharaniya way pradnyaparat or more precisely recently if you see couple of days back there was a study published from harvard university about how sound waves are impacting on the stem cells and helping the stem cell regeneration and preventing the cancer it can become a cancer treatment so these kind of mantrochar which falls under the category of devopashra chikitsa has already been said so this is an opportunity for ayurvedic research at a cutting edge knowledge to take lead and that should be done then obviously threats are that we have witnessed these threats that our ayurvedic products if they are not properly standardized right from its uh, pharmacognostic identification phytochemical identification purity testing and so on and so forth what we are facing two years back ayush was very much vehemently promoting kinospora cordifolia as a product for covid may be complementary product but what we are now saying that tinospora cordifolia there was a multi centric study a report was published in journal of gastroenterology that it is causing causing herb induced liver injury and we should come together to protect this why this has happened we should investigate why it is happening to us so these are the threats uh, i just wanted to highlight then identify the role of ayurved in the context of other available healthcare systems so we cannot say that ayurved is not there are so many other systems of medicine which are currently and simultaneously available to the community so we must identify what is the role of ayurved when we are doing the research whether it is going to be a complementary role or it is going to be an alternative role or it is going to be a competitory role we must understand that coming to the third point designing the study for research in ayurved now whenever we want to design the study for research in ayurved we should not adopt whatever modern methods are described now we know for sure that there are diverse methods of study designing particularly clinical study designing right from the n is equal to 1 study to randomized double blind placebo control studies but we need to choose the designs as per the suitability of the chosen problem similarly all ayurveda related determinants may not be possible to evaluate in a single project for example there are several determinants which are specific to the product the matra no anupan and so on and so forth some are which are specific to the individual dosha prakruti Uh, and and um, so so many factors are there so we have already identified these factors but every factor may not be relevant to the each project so we have to prioritize as per the need of that specific protocol and the project which we are investigating and then we must remember if we are doing research we have to follow the global rules what we can do while following those global rules of science we can always amend our protocols to that and we need to as i said bring objectivity to to our protocols 
and finally without taking much time whichever approach you may follow whatever research problem you may identify and whichever study design you may adopt what is most important is to keep fidelity to the ayurvedic fundamental principles that we cannot compromise at any time and we should always have the awareness of its translational potential to clinical practice back so we start our experience from the ground realities investigate the product at different levels of biological organization and come back again with the increase value based you know product or whatever you have it need not be only a medicinal product there are so many other things and come back to the its potential translational applicability has to be always kept in mind thank you that's what i have to say thank you sir yeah. as you have rightly said that uh, doing the swot analysis swot analysis in fact and then adopting approaches which are in tune with ayurvedic fundamentals and at the same time adopting the national and international guidelines which are applicable i understand that it is going to be a tough uh, thing because we have to on one side uh, uh, have the uh, i mean grounds in ayurveda principles but at the same time we have to balance the international guidelines national international guidelines but that is going to get, give us a better success and uh, that will help us to overcome the challenges which we are discussing today so thank you and very much sir global acceptance also will be there because yes sir uh, our second uh, panelist is for the day is uh, dr ravi narayan acharya who is newly designated director general of ccras uh, though sir has joined uh, uh, for the meeting he in fact is on his way to delhi to take uh, take over the charge as dg ccras so he has message that he won't be able to speak because uh, he is in travel uh, but thank you sir for joining and uh, we hope that you will join us uh, in the next meeting and we will be able to hear you in the next meeting if you can speak a few words you are welcome to say thank you thank you dr priya and my regards to all the members and panelists of this uh, uh, webinar today organized by the research council and uh, i will contribute definitely because we need research in every aspect of uh, ayurveda starting from what uh, samajha madam was saying from drug research to literary research but uh, uh, but kishor was saying and uh, clinical research but kashuni ji was saying every aspect we we have to explore and whatever our strength what uh, as a discussed we have to find it out and in a proper planning way i will uh, i'll share my views and will take consider all these points uh, raised by different uh, learned members ex panelists in this panel and uh, i will take care of them thank you thank you sir thank you sir thank you sir thank you thank you uh, dr abhinandan ji for your uh, thoughts uh, we look forward to hearing more from you and uh, in the coming days our next panelist is uh, dr unni krishnan ji uh, he is an ayurvedic physician and a development researcher he has an undergraduate degree in ayurveda from bharatiya university coimbatore and a masters degree in medical anthropology from the university of amsterdam netherlands he also holds a doctoral degree in international development studies from the yokohama national university japan and uh, since 2010 he has been working with the united nations university tokyo japan in various capacities in health systems and sustainability related programs we are indeed honored to have you here sir uh, our question to you is how to identify the area of research in ayurveda that needs to be addressed immediately and how do we prioritize the issue in the local and global context over to you sir thank you very much uh, respected dignitaries uh, am i audible yes sir you are audible yeah okay so thank you very much uh, it's an honor to be part of this uh, group um, so thank you dr anupama and uh, dr supriya and dr akash for facilitating this i will be brief um, but i think uh, i want to touch on three aspects of your question one is identifying research areas what are the immediate priorities then uh, that's the 
second point. And the third one is local and global context. So let me begin with some reflection on these three uh, first. I think the local and global context, uh, local uh, by local, if we mean national context and the global context, I, I think the issues are slightly different because of the, uh, the regulatory and licensing systems that are in place, the education systems that are, that are in place, the kind of institutional base that are within the national context are very different. So I think the first point is that we need to be extremely careful in uh, looking at what are these specific context uh, requirements. So the, the research uh, requirement for national context may be quite different from that of the international context. That's the first reflection. Second is that I think often um, we tend to limit our research into clinical drug research and to, to some extent now into wellness kind of domains. But I, I would suggest that there is a much of uh, uh, Ayurvedic evidence is shadowed by the socio-political system that, are, that we are placed in both nationally and internationally, including the, the kind of um, reference that is coming to many of our drugs and the contaminations and so on, that uh, uh, there is much of a social and political angle. So I, my uh, request is that we need to have a broader base uh, to our research, including the, the social dimensions uh, and which moves beyond the clinical and drug research. Then I think uh, based on this, the local and the, or, uh, the national and international context and this broad based approach to research, I think we will need to carefully think what is uh, most essential to bring a robust uh, science policy interface. Uh, that's how we call it. But I think in Ayurveda's context, we could add uh, one more dimension, which is repeated in the earlier panel as well, uh, from practice to science to policy, how do we build this interface? And I think that has to be very carefully thought about for uh, what is required for national and global context. Now, uh, to come to some of the uh, example areas uh, which are relevant for both, I would just uh, try to highlight three dimensions of it, uh, uh, two of which are both relevant for local and global, which are immediate priority needs. Uh, one is um, some of us, uh, uh, Dr. Amanohar, uh, Dr. Kishore, Dr. Anubhuma, all of us have writing about but sorry, those yeah. are, uh, sorry, I think your voice is breaking. You're not able to hear you clearly. Okay. So the large body of um, uh, a clinical knowledge base that's not yet systematically documented. And I think a consortium like this uh, needs to take uh, a cognizance of this and suddenly act on how to facilitate. Oh, I think we lost him. Uh we can uh, we can move on to the next question and I have him I think, I think because we Supriya, lost yeah. yeah yeah super you can continue so I think Dr. Unni was saying that the evidence uh, should not only be from clinical and experimental research but even the clinical evidence base should be documented and should be given a due importance and therefore a new means for in our context of Ayurveda, we should really think what we are talking about evidence and what evidence we really want to generate. So taking uh, from that, uh, I will now move to the next panelist, Dr. Girish Tillu. Dr. Girish Tillu is a Vedya scientist and uh, working as an editor for Journal of Ayurveda and Integrative Medicine. Currently, he's working on uh, very interesting projects such as Rasayana and uh, Prakruti and Microbiome. Uh, with this brief introduction, uh, Dr. Girish, I would like to ask you the question. Since you are working with JIM for last 10 years, uh, poor quality research publication is one of the issues which is often discussed when it comes to Ayurveda research. So uh, what would you suggest that how we can overcome this problem and how we can encourage Ayurveda researchers, Ayurveda scholars to write good quality publications? 
Yes, thank you very much uh, for this opportunity to interact with all the scholars and especially on this very important topic. As we all know, uh, may Ayurvedic institutes, Ayurvedic uh, clinicians and researchers, they really work on several, uh, several projects. Our clinicians, uh, they do treat many complicated cases, but we are uh, not doing good in terms of our publications. And there are several uh, recent initiatives, uh, th those are uh, really started for boosting good quality publications of Ayurveda domain. And hence, first, I suggest that we need awareness uh, at the level of students, faculty, researchers, then practices. If we read good, then we certainly uh, publish good. And third thing is, uh, we should not restrict ourselves uh, to a very typical uh, list of journals because uh, we should be able to ideally propagate our message. And there are so many journals, though they can really, uh, they, they will be happy to have Ayurvedic uh, uh, articles from Ayurveda related research. I'm going to discuss here two such experiments which we have initiated in Sabitri Bhai Phule Pune University, of course, with, uh, with the help of uh, several uh, colleagues and institutions. First, our university has a center for publication ethics. And this particular center for publication ethics is started with the objective to improve awareness about publication ethics, predatory journals, and teach students, PhD scholars and faculty of our university, the best practices and the entire scenario of publication ethics, reporting guidelines, scientific writing, etc. Because this particular area is also very rapidly changing and developing. And hence we designed a course for our PhD students. This is a 30 hours, means two credit course where we give our students an overview of what is ethics, what are the guidelines, what are the, uh, what means actually publication misconduct, what are predatory journals, what are best practices, which are the uh, national and international platform and fora that we should be aware of. And then uh, we conducted this course, uh, we evaluated more than 600 PhD students uh, and gave them this intervention. And again, we evaluated what, what is the level of their awareness about publication ethics. And we got very encouraging response. Based on this exercise, we approached to Maharashtra University of Health Sciences, MUHS, and we have now uh, completed a mapping of awareness of more than 800 faculty uh, of MUHS from different colleges and data analysis is ongoing. Then we thought that let us customize this course with the needs of Ayurvedic research. And hence we customized this course and we conducted, uh, we, we are in the process, uh, thanks uh, Dr. Ravi Naranji, you are here. Uh, we have now, over, we are now working with CCRS and completed uh, awareness program of two batches of CCRS scientists and uh, covered the program for 220 CCRS researchers. This is the uh, program that includes Ayurveda specific case studies, Ayurveda specific case scenario, how to write uh, for multidisciplinary audience, how to propagate and communicate Ayurveda research. And uh, the third batch of CCRS will be, uh, the CCRS scientists will be uh, completed in uh, third week of March. Then uh, we extended this experience and now we are working with na uh, National Commission for ISM and uh, uh, we are planning an on-site training program of uh, one week where we are going to train the trainers, the senior professors and senior guides from all the Irish colleges. So this is ongoing activity. The second activity, which uh, I'm here to um, uh, share, this is initiated by our 
um, team and our colleagues, Dr. Supriyaji uh, suggested that we should have journal club because if our, if our students and faculty, they read good, they, they have a habit of assessing a research paper, then uh, our students and faculty, they, they will be able to write well. And hence, for the last 17 months, we have initiated uh, an online journal club and we are getting uh, our mentor is none other than uh, Vaidya sir. Vaidya sir in a, almost every general club, he mm, guides us on the respective aspect of that particular research design. And the format is a student or a faculty from Ayurved college, um, uh, Ayurved colleges, uh, they present a paper and we invite many experts, a panel of experts and we discuss a research paper, what are the lacunae in, and strengths in experiments, also in reporting. And then this exercise helps us training authors, reviewers, editors, and most important, uh, tuning our readers with best practices of scientific writing and publication ethics. With these two experiments, uh, we learned a lot. Last year, the Ayurved student, Dr. Charu Sharma, who started this uh, journal club presentation as a student, she's now a faculty and she's conducting along with Dr. Vinay Pawar and others. They are now conducting this journal club. So Supriyaji, myself and Kishorji, we have uh, passed this baton to a new team and we, are also, we also have a new team in place. And I'm happy to tell you as we speak, our journal representation, uh, the topics and presenters, uh, they are ready till June uh, 2020. Uh, so if we uh, start with some small steps, then uh, I'm sure the scenario will be certainly better and different. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Girish, for the sharing these two interesting initiatives. Uh, just one question about your first initiative that uh, you said that uh, through Center of Publication Ethics, you are organizing and conducting workshops. So is there any uh, plan of uh, having this kind of uh, sessions or this activity through MOOCs so that larger audience can benefit through these uh, sessions? Yes, absolutely. Uh, we are planning uh, to host uh, many of these sessions on uh, MOOCs as well. Uh, but what we realize that this intervention is also a customized intervention, means uh, also interact with many uh, say panelists and uh, we also cater to various questions from the audience and hence the course, course is a little bit customized. I have shared two links. First link is Center for Publication Ethics and uh, the second link is our YouTube channel that is hosted by Ayush Center of Excellence uh, of our university. In this YouTube channel, you will find several videos and sessions uh, of all of workshops and training programs which we have already conducted. Every training program is recorded and that is available on YouTube. And hence, this particular link also forms a very good resource that is in public domain for free. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Girish. And I think that your second initiative is the answer to your question, that uh, the question which was posed to you, that how we can encourage Ayurveda researchers to write good publications. So unless you read good material, good publications, good published papers, you will not be actually able to write. I mean, the courses are always there, but you should actually take that experience. That is, uh, that is the message you want to give uh, for the researchers. So uh, coming, I mean, Moving ahead, uh, our next panelist is Dr. Suhas Kumar Shetty, who is Dr. Supriya, and uh, you mentioned MOOCs or MOOCs, something? MOOCs. Massive online open courses, MOOCs. Okay, massive online open courses. Okay. Um, like, uh, if, the if... ones which are available on Swayam portal, uh, anyone can visit Swayam portal and you can see that there are many courses, uh, yeah. okay. like many MOOCs are available. 
Yeah. Okay. Can I so when you something? get a chance, if you can just share the URL for Swayam or MOOCs, that will be great. Sorry, Dr. Girish. Yeah, MOOCs is uh, mm, uh, EDX, uh, Coursera, and many such courses. Uh, for this particular course, uh, publication ethics and scientific writing for I with I researchers, we have also developed a learning management system. And this learning management system is customized to the needs of Ayurveda researcher. We, uh, we have provided reading material as well, reading material related videos um, and assignment. And this assignment section really makes this uh, course very unique because unless participant, they uh, work on some assignment and they submit their assignment, then only they will be able to move to the uh, next uh, next topics. And hence, uh, this particular uh, very customized learning management system that we have uh, built for this particular program. So this is the update. Thank you very much. So the ethics, uh, so that is the URL where we can, people can find who are attending or listening later. Uh, where can they find these? And no, uh, this is uh, this is again uh, for those who have registered for this particular course. Because uh, before starting this course, we run a kind of diagnostic, uh, you know, survey, and that captures what are actually the needs, what are uh, uh, the level of awareness, and hence, although our course is very dynamic, we customize a little bit according to that particular batch, and then. Uh, we operate. So this is not just online uh, videos hosted, uh, but this is very dynamic, customized intervention for that particular group. And what we uh, have experienced that a group size of uh, say 100 and 150 that uh, we, we could uh, handle this group size for last six, seven batches. Uh, so this is, this is the uh, uh, learning from this exercise. Thank you. Is it open for international scholars? Also? Yes, certainly. It is, it is not, um, means we customize for a particular group that, that they, 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 there we are. Means, uh, um, there are uh, a couple of Ayurveda institutions, they have also approached us and we are also working with them for their PhD students and uh, faculty. We are now uh, conducting this course. Okay, we'll reach out, Dr. Girish. Uh, and just yeah. before handing to Dr. Supriya, Dr. Rajesh, can you share a link to our YouTube channel, Council for Ayurveda Research? We also have journal club meetings up on our website, uh, on our YouTube channel. So I think we should find a way to kind of bring the all the uh, public uh, domain information probably in one place. So, And Dr. Unni Krishnan has joined, Dr. Supriya, just so you know. I'm sorry. Um, I'm I'm traveling, so the connection is not so stable. I'll be brief and quick just to finish those uh, points. Uh, so one is uh, facilitating the existing clinical experience and um, uh, uh, I mean uh, re creating a, a research evidence from that. That's the first point. Second is uh, the the point um, that I mentioned. We have something called the holistic health system research platform now. It involves around 10 institutions in India, uh, which are uh, basically of social science, anthropology, I mean, anthropology, sociology, some public health experts and so on. And so uh, we are trying to do certain health system research um, programs. And this is essential, I think, in terms of understanding the social and political dimensions of, or dimensions of um, Ayurveda's acceptance or non-acceptance. Uh, so I think it is important to create such uh, data um, also. And here we could take help of um, uh, leading academics within India and abroad. And I think they have been operating outside the kind of uh, academy of Ayurveda and not fully uh, appreciated by the Ayurvedic physicians, be it on pharmaceutical industries or education and so on. Uh, so that's my second point. Uh, involve more health system research people and uh, advance that cause. Then the, the third point and the final point that I want to make is that um, 
definitely, I think, uh, as uh, some of the panelists earlier mentioned, the uh, innovations based on Ayurveda and from within Ayurveda can uh, be uh, coming only through stronger educational base within Ayurveda. So that's very important. But it's also important to have uh, strong international academic um, collaborations. Often what we find is, in my own experience living in uh, a couple of countries, what I have experienced is Ayurveda is um, promoted as a public kind of consumer medicine than an academic discipline. And this is slowly changing now. Uh, with uh, more academics coming. But I think it's very important to have um, key researchers involved and carefully identify collaborators. And the purpose should be communicating uh, um, communicating uh, the uh, evidence base and supporting quality and safety aspects, not to innovate from within Ayurveda, because probably through Ayurbiology or such programs, a new knowledge from within Ayurveda uh, cannot be generated. That will have to be based on Ayurveda's own epistemology and strengthening uh, the Swadhyaya Parampara within Ayurveda. And uh, uh, we spoke about uh, the Gurukula system, which, uh, which has never come back. There were experiments, and all of us, Ramana or myself, we were all part of that uh, Coimbatore education program, which was for seven years, eight years almost. So I think Within that epistemology, you can have new knowledge, but I think it's very important to have international academic collaboration, but carefully chosen. And I think we need to move beyond this kind of uh, public medicine. Definitely that social learning is important, but I think it should be academically stream, uh, streamlined. So thank you very much for these points I end. Uh, for joining in spite of having difficulties uh, during the travel, but uh, we appreciate that. And thank you very much for all those insights. Uh, I think the key points which you have mentioned is felicitating the, uh, uh, facilitating, sorry, clinical evidence, then uh, health systems research. And uh, uh, lastly, the strong international collaborations, uh, basically uh, for academic purpose. So these are the three main points which you covered during your speech. Uh, now, I would like to move forward and uh, like to invite Dr. Uh, Suhas Kumar Shetty, um, who is currently principal and uh, medical director at Kahar's BMK Ayurveda Mahavidyalaya at Belga. And before that, he was uh, working as dean of research at uh, SDM College of Hassan. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Suhas, uh, you have been uh, in education field and uh, you are active researcher as well. Is, uh, apart from the academic research, MD, PhD thesis, you are involved in uh, some projects, research projects actively also. So uh, after listening to all these deliberations, which we have started uh, from educational research in education and in research designs. So we often talk about challenges, uh, but we never, I mean, we hardly talk about solutions. So I would like to ask you that uh, what can be the potential solutions uh, for this scenario? And uh, from both your hats, like a researcher as well as educationist. Yeah. So, Namaste, everybody. Uh, greetings from the Kahir uh, Shri BM Kankanwadi Ayurveda Mahavidyalaya. Uh, I think uh, the future definitely belongs to uh, the research and technology. And uh, the inst our institution works with uh, the three basic uh, core principles of uh, bringing tradition, technology, and innovation. And there have been few uh, very best practices which have been carrying out by this institution. I think this can be one of the very uh, leading uh, solutions for few of the challenges that has been discussed in this forum today. Uh, I'd like to just uh, inform that probably it's a time that we need to develop this capacity building at all the levels of the stakeholders, maybe from students, faculties, researchers, clinicians, in all the areas, like the basic areas of education and uh, the technology and research. So yeah, there are at least three uh, important uh, best practices that has been taking in this institution. The first is, I think this is one of the uh, earliest uh, institution which has developed a department for the medical education in Ayurveda. This is called as DAME, Department of Ayurveda Medical Education. Uh, which trains the faculties in the basic concepts of teaching, learning, and evaluation of Ayurveda fraternity. 
And I'm very happy that this was recognized by the CCM and also the present NCISM has recognized this institution to uh, build the capacity among all the fraternity of Ayurveda. And we have been working with the NCISM to conduct various uh, capacity building programs. The next few important uh, practices that we have been doing is the developing the specialty clinics where we are trying to generate good amount of uh, the evidence based uh, 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 information and probably translating it into publications. At least there are three very important areas where we have developed uh, specialty clinics as well as the started the fellowship course of two years. The uh, first is the Ayur cardiology fellowship course, then the Ayur oncology fellowship courses and the obesity management courses. So these are the three areas that we have developed the specialty clinics and each one of them have developed their own treatment protocols and developed good amount of uh, the evidences, good amount of uh, the data that we have generated and uh, we also have good amount of publications related with these three basic areas. We strongly believe that uh, it's an era that we, we need to integrate the technology for the current scenario and which has been one of the uh, the very innovative area or the innovative uh, aspects of uh, this particular institution where we have developed a unit or a department called as Department of IU Technology where we are trying to uh, connect the basic concepts or basic science with the newer technologies. Integrating a lot of the newer artificial intelligences, machine learning without compromising with the basic concepts of Ayurveda and we have developed various numbers of uh, the technology transfers, like uh, more than 26 technology transfers, like 12 patents, which have been published, three have been granted. So where especially we have been trying to integrate with the, the engineering college, you know, the KLE engineering college, where the, we have this brainstorming sessions, where we discuss and probably come up with various uh, uh, mobile based applications which are user friendly. But I again very strongly believe that all this technology techniques should never overpower our the basic tradition or the basic concepts or the epistemological understanding. So these are some of the very probably uh, and uh, even the present NCISM now has identified our institution to conduct at least 12 elective courses for the undergraduate students. Uh, spanning from the basic concepts till the technology empowered uh, courses and uh, we'll be very happy to uh, we are in the process of uh, finalizing this content uh, for this uh, elective courses which will be 45 hours uh, courses of five modules and uh, we'll be uh, handing over this content to the NCISM which through their platform will be disseminating to all the stakeholders of the Ayurveda. I think uh, these are a few of the, I think, solutions that at present we can think of in terms of uh, uh, Ayurveda education, the specialty clinics practices, and the, the de development of the Ayurveda technology wing. But basically, I strongly emphasize on the capacity building of all the stakeholders of Ayurveda. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Suhas. I think uh, capacity building is the key of all the solutions, I guess, because uh, whatever problems we are discussing, it is because mainly because of uh, lack of understanding, lack of knowledge, lack of uh, availability of the things. So uh, the, everything starts for that only. Uh, even Julia has uh, suggested that there should be some courses where we learn things from both the paths and uh, certain things and even uh, Girish mentioned about the uh, scientific writing courses. So these are all attempts for capacity building. And I guess this is the message uh, from our panel that capacity building has is the key and uh, capacity building has to be in different domains, starting from what Dr. Raut said, that's walk analysis even. <laughs> Swark analysis, we should need it encompasses everything and that is the best solution. So with this, I think uh, we are at the end of uh, second panel. Uh, Dr. Akash, you want to say something or should we move to the third panel? No, I think we should it move. It is already yes, yes, yes. 
No, you're, 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 you're rightly concluded. I think we should move on to the next one. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Yes. Thank all the panelists for your inputs. Thank you very much. Yes. <clears throat> so I think, Dr. Akash, if I can, if I may propose that. To the third and last panel uh, yeah. for that. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Supriya. So I think in the interest of, because time really, we have enjoyed the discussion so much. I think if it's okay with everyone, we are going to skip the panelists' introductions um, and straight away, because this is a closed group. We all know each other. Um, if if you can permit, then we are going to just quickly start with uh, the third panel. Dr. Akash, may I just post the questions? Please, please. Okay because we do want to have a little bit of open forum. So for yeah. that, so I'm going to request panel um, number three, I'm going to announce, uh, Dr. Akash, can you at least announce the names of the panelists so that Dr. Mahadevan can spotlight everyone? Yeah, it's uh, Dr. Prasanna Kulkarni, uh, Dr. Satyanarayana B. And then we have Dr. Uh, Vaibhavi. Dr. Ashwini no. Kodbole. Ashwini Kodbole has joined, yes. All and the panelists, please come on video so that you can be spotlighted. Okay. Namaste. Uh, Namaste. Namaste. Uh, I, actually, if, if you can just read two lines about everybody, sorry about that. We should not be, we should not be skipping the introduction. Sorry. Then let's go ahead, yeah. Dr. Akash. One second, I'll have to. Can, can I just pose the question? Maybe then I can just, we can start talking then I'll, yeah. I'll just chip in, yeah. Yes, so I will, um, out of the two questions, I'm going to ask, I'm going to put a little more stress on question number one, um, which is please share your thoughts on one or two innovative ways to approach research in our sector. How do we actually, constitute the approach? Is it just pick up all of the existing models, RCTs or whatever is out there, the gold standard or the other methods? Or do we uh, integrate uh, the uniqueness of Ayurveda as a system um, and find a more suitable way for conducting research in Ayurveda? So how would you like to answer that question? And if you could also, if if you have some thoughts about any ways to integrate technology, current technology like AI or big data, um, you can please comment on that. And if you can keep your thoughts to four minutes or so, that will be really appreciated. So we can start with Dr. Prasanna Kulkarni. Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you, uh, respected uh, dignitaries over here. Uh, uh, yeah, let me take up uh, the topic on current technology, usage of the current technology to understand Ayurveda or to make the uh, freshers in Ayurveda to understand or apply the technology in a better way. See, uh, as we all know that uh, this era is going towards artificial intelligence and the base of this artificial intelligence is uh, machine learning. So uh, eventually what we need to do is we need to create a better uh, data set, which is all the data has been already present in Ayurvedic classics. Either it can be in, in terms of uh, Rasaguna Vira Vipaka of a particular, of a drug, or it can be uh, Lakshanas or say symptoms, signs and symptoms that have been uh, uh, elaborately described in uh, various contexts. Like it can be premonitory symptom, Pura Rupa, Rupa, or in the uh, Upadrava or Arishtavastha. If we compile all those uh, uh, things and run machine learning algorithms, it will be very easy for any clinical practitioner to identify what are the important parameters that are going to decide for the better diagnosis or to identify the prognosis of that particular uh, sequence of uh, events or let's call it as a pathology. So by that, uh, we, we, we can we can minimize uh, too many uh, noises in those symptoms. Maybe like as you all know that there will be too many symptoms for one particular disease. And in the current scenario, it will be very difficult to identify those pathognomonic signs. So these kind of algorithms by uh, implying them on machine learning programs, I think it will be 
helpful for uh, uh, freshers to take up that and practice Ayurveda with a more confidence base. And uh, not only that, uh, going a step ahead, if we accumulate the experience of the various experienced Vaidyas, like for this specific avastha of a disease, say for example, for Pitta Prakriti person, if he is suffering with arm vata in Jhangala Pradesh, so what should be the uh, like line of treatment or what kind of combination you are going to select? Uh, let's compile all those information, put it, give it to the uh, system. Collect the same kind of information from other physicians who is practicing elsewhere. Take up those data and put it in the system. So now, with respect to all those experiences, their insights, the machine will run a good diagnostic and it will predict that this is a component which is very, very essential to identify the cause or the pathogens in that individual. And for that, this could be the better choice of uh, treatment. Either it can be uh, maybe the sutra or some uh, set of uh, treatments or it can be single herb or compound formulation whatsoever the machine will throw out of course it requires uh, laborious uh, like uh, input of the data good collections of uh, informations and at the same time using it in an effective way with the help of machine learning if we built such a model that is going to definitely help each and every practitioner at their clinical setup. And obviously, it is going to bring a good name and fame for the Ayurveda field. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank Can you. I just uh, shortly introduce him? Uh, Dr. Prasanna Kulkarni is from uh, Kala Bhairaveshwara College uh, in Bangalore. He uh, completed his post-graduation in 2004, and he has a rich experience of 18 years in teaching and research. And he has publications in many international journals. He was a chief uh, resource person for uh, research study conducted on uh, Singaporeans and Malaysians. So thank you, Dr. Prasanna, for your inputs. I hope uh, we'll be in touch and we'll continue our discussions so, later on. Dr. Could you Pekin? also could you also please introduce the rest of the panelists very briefly? Yes. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Dr. Satyanarayana B uh, is the principal of Munial Ayurved College. And he has completed his post graduation in the department of Bhaisha Jakalpana from IPGT and RA. And uh, he has been guiding the postgraduate students for the past 21 years. He's actively involved in design and development of formulations, quality control. And he's a very uh, recognized speaker as well as a panelist for many national and international uh, forums. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shatinan, for joining. Uh, should be okay. asked him to uh, give his opinion on this and then continues one by one. Thank you, sure. Sure, thank, thank you very too. much uh, for inviting me and giving me an opportunity to be a part of this uh, forum. A couple of sentences I would like to speak on both the tops that you have raised. Uh, first thing is we should understand the basic differences between Ayurveda and modern science when you take account of designing the research protocols. Our main concern must be given to the classical approach of Ayurveda. Research protocols should be aimed to validate the basic concepts of Ayurveda, not just uh, considering a disease and a drug. This type of thing. We have a concept like Prakriti, um, Agni, Dr. Akash, yeah, thank you. Rasayana. Shatkriya Kala, Agni Bala, Ojo Bala, there are many such concepts, they have to be revalidated. And we have multiple uh, possible models for them. And this kind of research work, when we design, it should involve experts from both Ayurveda and biomedical field. It should not run parallel, it should integrate in some places. So before starting any clinical trial, a complete knowledge about the diagnosis of disease without compromising Ayurvedic techniques and modalities should be planned. And now, whenever we plan for any clinical trial, we're ignoring the concept of personalized medicine. Ayurveda is the best model of personalized medicine about which the entire globe is looking at. So this particular aspect we will have to explore and we will have to consider the possibility of designing such protocols where the concept related with the molecular biology, pharmacogenomics, epigenetics, and personalized medicine are integrated with the various concepts of Ayurveda. 
and being a person of uh, Ayurveda pharma industry also in addition to teaching uh, drug research and clinical research, there are lots of opportunities for us to integrate various modern techniques in validating the concepts of Ayurveda, especially in relation to Rashastra and Vaishya Kalpana. We speak about Bhavana, we speak about Marana, we speak about various technologies of grinding, we speak about various classical tests of Basma and all these. We should never neglect those classical points that are mentioned in the text and every point can be validated with the help of modern tools. Just one example I would like to give, we say Varitara, that is when you sprinkle Basma on stand still water, it flows. So it is not simply the lightness, it's not depicting the lightness of the particle, but fineness of the particle, which binds together and it cannot overcome the surface tension of the water. It also speaks about the shape of the particle, the spherical particle, which is responsible to create a buoyant force because of which it flows. Once we understand this based on advance in water system, so we will be very clear about every concept that are described in our texts. There are many more things like this to be validated in my system, Rashastra and Vaishya Jakalapana are also various contexts that are mentioned in Samhitas. We should come together. Let us validate these concepts and give importance to the basics that are rooted in our text. So then it is easy for us to design the integrated models for research. So this is only what I want to say now. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Satyanarana. As a Rashastri, um, I'm also very excited with all the points you made about Varitara and what are some of the, uh, the, the chemical aspect of the Varitara phenomenon. Uh, thank you for bringing that in. And um, uh, Dr. Akash, would you like yeah. to introduce Dr. Uh, Vaibhavi, maybe? Yes. Yeah, uh, so Dr. Vaibhavi Joshipura is a consulting uh, periodontist with more than 25 years of experience. And uh, she has her own setup called as Intident Healthcare, a platform to integrate health sciences and technology into practice. Uh, she was the Dean of uh, Rajiv Gandhi University of Dental Sciences and Hospital Bangalore. And she was the Chief Operating Officer for In Institute of Ayurveda and Integrative Medicine from 2016 to 2018. Uh, thank you, Dr. Vaibhavi Ji for uh, joining us. And I thank Dr. Prasanna Kulkarni for uh, referring her name to us. Uh, so if you would like to come in and uh, give your inputs on the two questions that have been posed. You're, you're on mute, Dr. Vaibhavi, if you can unmute yourself. Yeah, am I audible now? Yes, you are. Thank yes, you. yeah. So first of all, thank you very much for inviting me on this platform. Um, I do not come from Ayurveda background, but um, have been in close contact with uh, lots of Ayurveda charyas and trying to learn a lot about um, Ayurveda as a health science and how uh, it can help my patients, the dental patients, um, getting the most benefit, which uh, due to the limitations of uh, allopathy or modern bioscience, the patients are currently not able to avail. So I may not be able to... Um, give you the pinpoint uh, uh, you know, answers about the questions you posed about the research in Ayurveda or the technology in Ayurveda. But uh, I could definitely say with my own experience as an integrative dentist uh, that um, in uh, today's scenario, uh, no person will be dependent only on one health care for the uh, medical problems that they undergo. And if we don't have the dialogue between different health sciences or the communication, and that could reflect in education, in research, and also in clinical practice, then uh, individually doing anything may not ultimately uh, convert or translate into the additional benefit to the patients. Nowadays, patients are very scared to... Uh, tell an allopathy doctor that I'm taking medicines for uh, Ayurvedic medicines for diabetes. Or when they come to Ayurveda doctor, they're very scared to say that I want to go for knee surgery replacement. So uh, that is number one. And um, uh, with my experience, I feel that the Ayurveda curriculum still has a uh, you know, whole chunk of allopathy uh, subjects 
but that is not the case with the allopathy curriculum. That means the MBBS and BEDS students have no exposure to what Ayurveda is. And uh, how Dr. Unikrishnan was talking about socio-political aspects, that has resulted in a you know, lot of friction between the allopathy and Ayurveda uh, doctors because the allopathy doctors really do not have any idea about what the Ayurveda health science is. So um, when we talk about um, uh, um, research in Ayurveda, as Dr. Satyanarayana rightly said that without integrating the two, we will not be able to go far um, because I have seen most of the Ayurveda doctors depending on x-rays and MRIs and all kinds of reports, which are technologically advanced, you know, which are taken from the modern biosciences. At the same time, um, there are very few, but the, the good number of doctors who uh, actually look at Ayurveda for the, you know, like me, you know, for the benefits of the patient. So ultimately the technology in research uh, in Ayurveda is all fine about machine learning and AI, uh, but we should not forget that ultimately when it comes to uh, giving care to the patient, it's both combined. You know, you cannot separate it out when a patient is sitting in front of you. And I would like a scenario where, as Dr. Satyanarayana rightly said, that the integrative research protocols are designed. And for that, I would also suggest and I would request that if something can be done by which MBBS and BDS students also get to know about Ayurveda uh, as an introductory or, you know, a, a subject, wherein it, in, it, tomorrow's practitioners are more open to uh, working with Ayurveda doctors as team. So the way I work with my Shalakya uh, counterparts to handle the oral conditions, pre-malignant or malignant conditions, uh, stress-related, autoimmune, all kinds of conditions, and also into the uh, clinical practice, like simple things like uh, extraction of teeth or root canals, or, uh, you know, uh, there is a whole lot of spectrum of uh, uh, issues where uh, the integration uh, will work wonders. So there is a need to do a lot of research in, in uh, especially in my uh, area where the oral conditions are concerned. And for that, um, I, would, I, I would request that um, the Shalakya faculties or the Shalakya departments of Ayurveda colleges could please come out with something. Um, because most of the time the Shalakya uh, uh, departments have only the ophthalmology and nobody is uh, thinking about the dental and most, most of the ENT and other aspects of Shalakyas. Uh, so um, uh, more than that, I would not be able to stress on uh, research in Ayurveda in, at this point of time, but definitely this has been a great learning experience for me to be you know, present with these stalwarts in the field of Ayurveda. So thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to talk about it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Dr. You. So uh, just to have... you know, quickly, quickly um, uh, respond or you know also add to what uh, what Dr. Vaibhavi just mentioned. Uh, so my background is I was with Ayush for thirteen years. I'm a batchmate of Dr. Katoch and Dr. Manoj Nesri. And then I had to come here to US. So I have had an opportunity to work in a totally different environment and uh, non-government sector, private sector. So I was part of actually two integrative practices here. I'm still a part of one of them. Uh, so uh, the first one closed down. So uh, that is the medicine of future. We, we will be able to cherry pick the appropriate suitable uh, solutions for the client at that particular time. So that is happening. And also I would like to add that in US at least, we have some institutes where we have Ayurveda as an elective course. Mm -hmm. And I myself, while I was in India, I was part of a WHO initiative pilot project actually of introducing Ayurveda at school level. So 20 Kendra Vidyalayas. And that also should happen. Actually, it should be part of the general community, not just uh, any type of medical colleges, uh, uh, just that, but also general population. So yes. I, I think those things need to be kind of um, those um, 
uh, perspectives or those uh, uh, visions need to be given more energy and body and, and uh, momentum and support. Um, so hopefully um, we have some volunteer note takers. So we will be taking these notes and hopefully bringing it to the uh, notice of uh, Ayush. Thank, Thank you, you, Dr. Vaipali. Thank you so much. Yes, over to you, Dr. Akash, to introduce Dr. Ashwini. Yeah, and then uh, we will open up for the... Yeah, so we have uh, Dr. Ashwini, uh, who is Associate Professor at the Transdisciplinary University. Uh, she has completed her PhD from NCBSTF, PIFR in Cell Biology and Biophysics. And... Uh, she then joined uh, the TDU, that is the Transdisciplinary University in 2011, and she has worked on Rasayana project. And currently she's working in the field of Ayurveda neurobiology and solutions for cognitive health and the neurogenerative degenerative disease. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ashwini, for joining us. And uh, if you can please share your inputs on the questions posed. Yeah, thanks to Kar uh, for involving in this. And uh, to answer this question, I think I'll take I'll continue what Dr. Pratibha was saying just now, that it has to, uh, I think the main thing which we need to do is that start with wellness, wellness related uh, research, so that everybody, everybody in the society can participate in that. And uh, enough, we talk about illness, I think we should talk more and more about wellness. And that's where I'm coming from that the lab and the clinic co collaboration, continuous collaboration of lab and clinic is very important as a biologist, as a neurobiologist. First of all, I'm a big fan of Ayurveda, but just that was not enough. I wanted to see what happens at the biological level. And if we design the tool and if we are constantly discussing with the clinicians and the Ayurvedic experts, uh, I think we will have definitely will have uh, much better experimental strategies, much better research strategies uh, for, and much fruitful uh, research which is come in future in near future i'm very confident because as i feel that for biomedicine the modern biomedicine there is a set of two sets there is a set of treating uh, practicing doctors and there are scientists like us who are actually doing research for ayurveda it's one and the same so i think it's important for uh, developing a career of people uh, who are interested in ayurveda research doing basic research in Ayurveda and still talking to clinicians and clinicians who are giving inputs in the basic research of Ayurveda. So that's my, uh, that's my thing, short answer for the first question. And then the second one I feel is the uh, real world data analysis, the currently whatever the millions and millions records of with Ayurvedic physicians and very senior Ayurvedic physicians. I think somebody has to take efforts and I, the little bit which I did in when I joined TDU IIM uh, is that I studied, I uh, was part of the group which was doing KAP. I was not doing KAP, Knowledge, Attitude and Practice Survey. Uh, there was a group in our big group who was doing that. And I think that was very, very uh, good survey. And I think that that was on anemia. And similarly, we can do for um, everything and including wellness. And that's what I'm looking forward to in my field right now the cognitive health, and similarly, we can do it for everything. I feel that's the second one, uh, analyzing the existing data, learning from the existing practice, and, uh, the, and the big data which is available, mi millions of records with all the hospitals, private practitioners, and so on, and very senior Vaidyas. And that's what uh, we scientists should also take efforts and, the, and I don't differentiate between scientists coming from pure science or the modern science and the Ayurvedic scientists all are same science is science so which I feel that uh, these two are my thoughts on uh, these uh, these two questions the points which we have put for this panel today so thanks thank thanks. you and thank giving you. me opportunity to talk in front of Ashok Vaidya sir Lakotia sir I think that's great I'm happy to be here Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ashwini. Uh, Dr. Akash, if I can just wind up in 30 seconds and open the forum. Is it okay? Okay. Yes. So thank you so much to all the panelists for enriching for an enriching discussion on uh, the innovation and technology side of things. Uh, all points are very relevant that we should uh, 
uh, integrate and embrace what we know uh, today, which is the new technologies, but not at the cost of losing our principles. So both of the things have to be kept in mind. And uh, some such uh, big data analysis is already happening. I'm aware that, doc, uh, that at Jiva, I believe they have um, a very large number of records, patient records, and they are doing some big data analysis. So we will be able to kind of learn uh, from some uh, such initiatives that have already been undertaken, what's working, what's not working, what are the gaps. So I think it's an ongoing thing and we will continue to kind of uh, bring in a discussion about the best practices, how to go about these things. So thank you so much once again. And I would like to request Dr. Lakotia. I know he has stayed up late today and then move on to Dr. Ashokji and uh, everybody else. But I know Dr. Lakotia has some thoughts to share. Dr. Lakotia, please. Okay, uh, I hope I'm audible. Uh, I, I, I must appreciate uh, the depth of uh, discussion that has gone on, and I thank uh, Pratibhaji for this and organizing this. It it has been a great learning experience. But I mean, uh, as uh, somebody who is not from within Ayurveda, and, and I look uh, have a ringside view of of it, the way things are, my major concern is that all the philosophies, all the principles that are there in Ayurveda, and you see, whenever we, we raise a question that how does it do. The answer comes, there is a, some a shlok that says, says this, but then that's not the answer. I, I, I think we need to get out of, of that kind of a shell. We, we need to, yes, maybe they knew it all, they, but, but do we know that? Because unless we come to what we are now, uh, the, our things will not progress. And that's where the questioning attitude, the questioning even, questioning even the base, so-called basic principles, that must happen. We must, and, and, and you see the idea of that, okay, to have a shift between allopathy and science and the modern medicine is, is something wrong. And, and this is something that, I have, that I've been writing in, in several of my articles that we need to integrate them. And I, th I thought Ayurvedic biology was a wonderful way to put all these things together. And, and that must be promoted with, with an open mind, not to say that, okay, I'm right and you are wrong or something else. Something like that. In, in science, anybody can be wrong and anybody can be right. And that's the questioning approach we must have. And, and the, the, you know, the various things that have been discussed, I hope, I, I, I mean, as I can see from my experience in during the last decade, things have been kind of uh, melting pot. Things have started mixing to some extent, not to the extent that it should have done, but I think that this is the way that we can go ahead and have more discussions, more openness. And to the young students, you see, this is most important that if we start teaching them with the principle that these are inviolate, we will never end up in, in a proper way. We, we tell them these are the principles, but then we should also make them aware that these need to be questioned, these need to be understood in what we understand in scientific terms today. And I think only when we do that, we will have success. So uh, thanks again for uh, letting me be here and uh, say my points. Thank you. Thanks thank you. All. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lakotia Ji. And um, I, I, we really appreciate your insights from somebody who is outside. And uh, uh, in the beginning, if you, uh, if you were there, I think I uh, highlighted some of these things that it's um, not enough to dwell in past glory. Right. It's, it's important to take actions to justify it today. So um, sure. I think we are trying to build that tone and tenor of not just resting on something that's probably been said. So uh, we need to we need to be objective. We need to be humble that certain things may need uh, more introspection, more re may revisit, um, and it's okay to do that. So, but thank you for highlighting that once again. Now on to Dr. Ashok Vaidyaji to hear his. Um, uh, views and then open up to everybody else also. Uh, sir, you're on mute. I enjoyed the entire session, but when Dr. Lakotia is here, I would like that we should first do a survey of research already done. For example, in the Kaakalp work, the study on Drosophila, 
as well as the studies which have been done with plant principles, single plant principles also, and which are the highest concentration in the plants also. And what uh, was told earlier that basic scientists are more interested than medical professional or clinical scientists in Ayurveda research. To get Dr. Lakhotia involved and committed also took some time. But when Ayurvedic biology came up as a field, we could get many molecular biologists, life scientists, immunologists, geneticists, all looking at this. So Ayurvedic research to my mind is at multiple levels of organization. So it can be done at the community level, it can be done at a single personalized level or many persons level. It can be done on organ or a tissue or a body fluid or a cell or even the molecules. And recently, we are involved with my daughter, Professor Vidita Vedya, at TIFR doing research on mitochondrial genesis. And we have some amazing results of mitochondria in primary neuronal cell cultures. This is published in PNAS. So even we have taken several plant and with identified extract with identified concentrations. And I think that to my mind, we should bypass a bit of medical clinical research and really go to fundamentals, but I disagree with Dr. Lakhotia about sutras. I think he's right when we just make them cram and repeat and believe everything is wonderful. But I and Namyata has evolved a falsifiability approach to sutras. Now, falsifiability approach is totally different from probability statistics approach. And that means that it has to have sufficient experimental content to prove the statement wrong, Dr. Lakhotia. And I think that this has been now a new approach in research in general, because probability got evolved from gamblers actually. And that's most important part for us is to develop Ayurvedic statistics. Now, when you say Ayurvedic statistics, it is not, not based on mathematics, but our pramanas are different. And that those pramanas have held the nation together for millennia. So we must have based on pramanas, what we call verifiability index or verity index, and their clinical experience, biological uh, plausibility, and pharmacodynamics, as well as cellular and molecular action or active principles, all are showing an integrative activity. As Sarpaganda showed, for example. Now, we say that we should publish only in Indian Journal, but if my teacher, Professor R.J. Vakil, had not published Role for your work in British Heart Journal, Razor Pin would have never come. Nobody have given attention to Ayurveda also. And what Razor Pin led to, Dr. Lakhoti understands this very well, is that catecholamine uptake is inhibited. And then the side effects shown by Gannath Sen, like galactoria, Parkinsonism, depression, these were the clinical side effects. And now all modern drugs have been developed based on the reserpine depletion of biogenic amines and prevent the, what the uptake is prevented. Now, based on that, galactoria treatment, Parkinsonism treatment of L-dopa, as, well as, uh, as well as depression, antidepressant treatment have evolved. So Ayurveda, to my mind, is a vast potential for not only molecular pharmacology, but therapeutics. And that's why I always say we must go from bed to bench and from bench to bed again. And that's why reverse pharmacology and repurposing of drugs are the most crucial 
but at the same time i said in the beginning ayurveda is not only yukti vipassana and there are documented records of mantra healing there are documented records of terminal cancer also reporting uh, responding to some ayurvedic therapy total therapy how i think single cases can sometimes lead to a whole watershed of research because the well documented single case of cholera led to the epidemic of cholera understanding in england until then we had never known biblio cholerae also so i think documentation of n equal to 1 studies is a wonderful design second design very important is sequential trial design i had the good fortune to attend a big workshop in france of armitage and armitage in war evolved this sequential trial design and a very small sample size if you have the criteria of objective response is well within a short period you can come up with Or did we lose the arrangement management okay. thank you okay okay I, i will just say that i do not disagree with uh, <laughs> any of the point that were made and that maybe i, I didn't say anything uh, and that uh, my my only thing is that all these principles we need to validate we need to substantiate and separate the myths from facts that, that, that's all i'm saying thank you yes thank you thank you to both of you and thank you to everybody else i think um, we are committed to continuing to refine our understanding as well as our approach and as well as our implementation of what we understand so that continued refining a uh, commitment is needed from everybody and uh, wearing a cap of uh, objectivity while doing so is is something we are all committing to so with that i think we are at the end of the hour um we really wanted to have a really a little longer open forum discussion forum but uh, uh due to paucity of time i think everybody had a lot of ideas and thoughts uh please feel free to come on video uh for a couple minutes before we sign off uh but i think very good takeaways from today's meeting uh, it's a closed door meeting and our next meeting please make a note may 15th uh you will all be in the cc and we will plan it in a in a way that uh we have a little more of a round table discussion rather than panels moving forward where everybody is chipping in and we have some again from today's meeting we have at least three note takers who are taking copious notes uh, so we will be collating the notes and sharing with all of you who are here and also a recording of today's event so feel free to please share internally wherever you like and um, uh the commitment from council for right with the research is to facilitate uh, this uh, discussion this type of discussion this type of futuristic um, um, vision and uh, creating a road map uh, where we can all with the variety of inputs no one perspective is complete uh, it, it we need to come together and listen and uh receive and share uh and integrate um everything that we are uh, that is coming to the table and pick up all of the you know nuggets and create best practices for the fraternity and uh, continue to hone continue to um um increase the body of 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 all the sops and best practices for the fraternity to benefit from to continue to provide this um vision 2030s for a lack of better term right now we can call it that but really it's time and it's it feels like it's time for a change for a positive shift and no time is better than now and i must thank everybody for taking out time this is a lot of time from everybody's daily um, you know timetable 3 hours is a lot of time but i i hope you all feel that these 3 hours were well spent 
um, it is time to bring together not just uh, people from India. And that is why this effort, because uh, we can't be sitting in our own country and uh, uh, looking for globalization from within the country. We have to we have to kind of open our minds to how is the world looking at us to get that external viewpoint as well. So I think all in all, that is the goal of these gatherings. And I hope with these quarterly meetings, we can uh, maintain some, some form of continuity of thought process and continue to kind of build on what we are identifying as good directions to move towards. So with that, thank you so much. Any, any parting comments or thoughts are welcome. Otherwise, you will be receiving an intimation of the May 15th meeting. Only, only one parting half shloka. Nahi kalyana krut kashchit durgadim tat gachati. So, the genuine, sincere efforts will always bear fruits. And I think that all of us need to learn Sanskrit very well. And one day I hope that our council has a meeting held in Sanskrit language. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank, you, everyone. thank you, everyone. Thank you. We'll be in touch. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Julia. Thank you. And great suggestion, international CMEs. We will take it up. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Ashwini. Ashwini. Great ideas here. Thank you. Um, the core committee, if you want to just stay for just a little bit, just one, yeah. one minute or so. Should uh, we stop the recording? Yes. Yeah. Can you stop? One yes. second. I'm just making sure we don't miss anything in the chat because this chat is not downloadable. Okay. So uh, thank you again, everyone. Um, any thoughts from your end? Are we, I think we, we kind of managed all the glitches that came up. Mm. Some people not joining, some people joining, but not audible. <laughs> I think we managed fairly well, right? Yeah. Yes, yes, we did. We, we did, did a great job. job. We did a great job. Yeah.